everyone. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the board. It's 9.30 a.m. and today is Friday, June 5th. My name is Dana Zorda and I'm a member of the county's Office of Technology and Innovation. I'll be playing the role of technology moderator for today's virtual budget information session. On the pa panel with me is Don Crawl of the county attorney's office who will be serving as process moderator. Before we start the meeting, I'd like to do a quick roll call and ensure we have adequate communications for each of, each of you. Can we start with Commissioner Eggers? Uh, good morning, Dana. Good morning, sir. Commissioner Seal. Good morning, Dana. Good morning. Commissioner Welch. Good morning, Dana. Good morning, sir. Commissioner Long. Good morning, Dana. Good morning. Commissioner Justice. Good morning. Good morning. Commissioner Peters. I'm here, good morning. Good morning. And Commissioner Gerard. Morning, everyone. Good morning. Mr. Administrator, I will now turn the meeting over to you. Okay, good morning, commissioners. Um, we, have, we do have a full agenda. Uh, some of the items shouldn't go that long, but we do have um, a lot of departments to get through and uh, one constitutional officer. Um, so our first up is parks and um, conservation resources. Paul, I think you're up. Uh, Jim, I believe you're muted. Oh, yeah. Jim, you starting it off? I'll go ahead and start it. Someone? Uh, Someone good morning, might. commissioners. I'll, can you can hear me okay? Off. Okay. Okay, I got hear you, Shane. Okay, uh, Jim Abernathy with the Office of Management and Budget. Uh, I am the, uh, the current uh, budget analyst for the Parks and Conservation Resources Department. Uh, also with us today is Paul Kazi, the director of, uh, of PCR, and uh, Shane Coons is uh, going to do the SPM portion of uh, the presentation today. So uh, I think we'll start off with Shane this morning. Thank you, Jim. Uh, good morning, commissioners. Uh, I am the former strategic performance management analyst for Parks and Conservation Resources, and uh, I will be filling in for the current analyst, Tiana Walker, who regretfully could not be here today. Uh, following the FY19 budget discussions, we began an initiative to capture and define the existing levels of service for the operation and maintenance uh, of county parks. A high-level overview of the preliminary findings and current recommendations has been provided to you as an attachment. The purpose of the attached report is to address the known gaps while we complete the remaining data analysis and recommendations for you. A full report on this is expected to be delivered in July. COVID-19 has had significant impacts on our county parks, both positive and negative. The temporary closing of beaches and shelters resulted in a $1.3 million loss of revenue from beach uh, parking and campground and shelter reservation fees. The pandemic has also caused an increased focus on sanitizing county park facilities and equipment, proper staff PPE use, and social distancing of park staff and guests. Despite the negative financial impact and closures, some of our parks saw record attendance as citizens sought open uh, green space to social distance. Many of parks work plan initiatives are not going to be directly impacted by COVID-19. With the exception of the integrated vegetation management plan, the completion of this initiative was delayed due to social distancing requirements. The BCC update on the unincorporated recreation work session has also been postponed to later this year. Uh, that is all I have for the strategic performance and uh, update. Uh, Jim, if you would like to take over for your budget section. Thanks Shane. Um, so uh, there are a couple areas of uh, opportunities for efficiency for PCR. Uh, in this upcoming fiscal year, uh, the department is going to look at new technology for uh, parking management. Uh, currently they have 43 parking meters and those are coming towards the end of their life. They, uh, since they sit out in the elements, uh, they take a pretty good beating and to uh, replace those, it's estimated that's gonna cost about $600,000 they are looking at a different way or different ways uh, to uh, to manage parking at their various facilities, and they think that they can uh, do that at a at a fraction of that six hundred thousand dollar estimated cost. Um, after they do their study, they'll uh, will be brought uh, back as uh, as a way to uh, save 
uh, operating cost in the future. Um, the department is also looking or is preparing to realign um, part of their uh, personnel so that they can have more frontline positions uh, in horticulture uh, and facilities maintenance. And what it will, uh, what the ultimate or the overall effect will be is a uh, reduced annual personnel cost and um, increase in accountability and uh, staff visibility in PCR facilities. Uh, the department submitted three decision packages in FY21 or for FY21. Uh, the first one is to uh, upgrade a, a current part-time position um, at Wheaton Island to a full-time position and it'll cost approximately $42,450. Uh, it's to increase the educational programming at the facility and uh, also help with uh, building security. Uh, what this would do is bring up the staffing to match what is uh, currently at Brooker Creek. Uh, and is uh, there is support uh, by the Friends of Wheaton Island. Uh, the, the horticulture program is uh, looking to convert a current con contract position, uh, which they've been using for uh, over three years into a permanent full-time county position. Uh, there would be a net impact of approximately $34,600. Um, and this would uh, this position would be mainly focusing on uh, mowing and landscaping down at Fort DeSoto to help with the level of service. Um, and then also as part of the enterprise asset management program, uh, the, the department is looking to add a full-time GIS uh, position to support the, the program. Uh, the position was identified as part of the EAM program and would have a total impact of $93,000 uh, in FY21. Uh, as far as the, the budget for uh, PCR, they're supported by two funds. Um, mainly the, uh, the, the main source of funding is the general fund. They also have funding from the tree bank fund. Uh, the general fund, has uh, what approximately 62% of their uh, budget is personnel. Uh, and as I said, the general fund is the primary funding source. Um, their FY21 request um, without the decision packages is 22,000 or 22,714,000, um, which is a, uh, a slight increase from FY20. Uh, let's see. The, currently, their staff uh, in F would uh, increase by 2.1 FTEs. Uh, their personnel services are, um, or total expenses for the PCR uh, general fund is increasing by $300,000, uh, $306,000 or 1.4%. Uh, Personal services is increasing by 5% uh, to $14 million. Uh, operating is, show, is shown a decrease of 312,000 uh, in FY21. Uh, part of that decrease is uh, the fleet vehicle replacement. Uh, it's decreasing by $164,000. Uh, and then other operating supplies are decreasing by 125,000. Uh, capital outlays are increase are decreasing by uh, just over fifteen thousand, uh, which is two point eight percent. And uh, part of the capital outlays, uh, what's included in there is the um, added pieces of equipment that are not currently in the county's vehicle replacement program. So they replace pieces of equipment um, because of the uh, wear and tear that is associated with uh, with some of their equipment. Uh, the tree bank fund, uh, it, uh, the, the uh, total expenses are decreasing in FY21 by uh, $2,200. Uh, personal services is uh, the full decrease uh, and uh, it, it's also the total uh, expenses within the, uh, within the fund. Uh, revenues, as Shane was uh, saying earlier, um, COVID-19 uh, has had an immediate impact on the department's revenue stream in FY20. Um, 
and we expect there will be some impact in FY21 as well. Uh, there are also some user fees that uh, the department is looking to change. Uh, they're looking to uh, increase the cost for park road closures by $500 per request. Uh, they're looking to increase the, are they requesting to increase the campground fees uh, in both area one and area two from uh, $30, uh, from anywhere from 30 to $45 up to 32 at the minimum, up to 50 uh, at the top. Uh, they're also looking to increase the uh, reservation cancellation fee uh, from $30 to $45 range to the $32 to $50 range. And then beach access uh, park parking meters, uh, they're looking to increase that uh, to a maximum of $250 per hour. And that is uh, so that they can match the local uh, parking fees of where the, the parks are located so that um, they're not undercutting their uh, the community in which they're uh, located. On the revenue side, um, the total revenue generated uh, is decreasing in FY21 by $116,000 to $7.1 million. Uh, the general fund accounts for almost all of this uh, amount. Uh, the uh, Intergovernmental revenues, which uh, for parks for, uh, for parks is uh, grant related, uh, is expected to increase uh, by 3.3%. Uh, charges for services uh, are decreasing by 0.4%. Uh, uh, these are camping and shelter rental fees, beach parking, uh, those types of revenues. Um, and because of the closure of of the, many of the beaches and parks and campgrounds um, due to COVID-19, uh, there were, um, during the, uh, the three month period, um, that is usually our uh, highest level. Uh, it's expected that the revenues are going to drop about $1 million uh, in FY20. Um, fines and forfeitures uh, are increasing. Um, and uh, rents, surpluses, and uh, uh, refunds are decreasing by 5.5%. Uh, miscellaneous revenues uh, are increasing uh, almost 100%, um, or are decreasing, sorry, by almost 100%. And, and um, those, a lot of those are, were being changed to fines and forfeitures. Um, in the tree bank fund, the revenue is decreasing by $2,800, and uh, that is, um, that's the budget um, summary for PCR for FY21. Paul, would, would you like to? Um, okay, so yeah, let's get to Paul, and, and I want to loop back, Paul, and you can talk about your staffing report, you know, because that was a Commissioner has asked about that last year as part of the budget. So the hit the staffing report, the vegetation management that we're gonna be rolling out and um, the recreation report, in addition to the areas that are impacting your budget financially. Sure. Uh, good morning, commissioners, Paul Kazi, Parks and Conservation Resources Director. Uh, starting with the uh, staffing report, one of the things that we are currently working on, as mentioned, is a realignment. Um, of our organizational structure with the intention of being able to uh, really address some of the things that we hear most uh, from our uh, park patrons, uh, frequency of mowing, um, repairs to facilities with our craft workers and trades groups. So we think if we go to a, uh, uh, rather than a north-south, but potentially a north-central-south districts of our uh, park management that we can have people closer to the facilities that they need to uh, repair uh, as well as maintain and also be able to get uh, move some park rangers around so that we can address some of the areas where we don't have uh, sufficient coverage and primarily we'll do that we've got some retirements uh, that have occurred um, 
some uh, mid-level positions that uh, we think will be better served in the in the field. Uh, so that's the direction we're going there, and we hope to be able to present a, a, a realignment to administration this summer with the uh, hopes or the intention of implementing it in the fall. So that won't increase the cost of personnel, but actually the intention is to decrease our personnel costs. And if possible, if there are any savings, to look at some other contractual expenditures where we can also increase the level of service to address um, what, uh, what is important to our park patrons. Um, and Paul, you can kind of go into that because they're they're looking at a number of things, commissioners. And I, you know, I've seen the same things that you've seen in terms of uh, people concerned we don't have enough rangers for coverage and things like that. But we also have rangers, you know, and this goes all the way back to the downturn in the economy, doing things that really rangers, you know, shouldn't be doing, right? Cleaning bathrooms um, and things like that. So he's looking at the whole service level, and is there a, a way of providing the right coverage? With alternative, you know, means of of, uh, of accomplishing the work tasks, so it's all on the table. That's the reason they they wanted to have that complete prior to this meeting, but they just got behind and, and haven't been able to complete that. So, but I, I did want to raise some of those issues. So if you want to ask any questions, you know, he he certainly can address that. But that's they're trying to look at all the different workload measures um, and trying to determine to make sure we have a proper coverage uh, within our parks. And one of the things, if I can add to that, that's a good example, looking at the uh, restroom cleaning. One of the things we have done over the last few years is with our um, trash removal. Um, you know, our rangers were spending a lot of time emptying individual trash cans. One of the things we've been able to do is use the um, trash hauler in some of these communities um, same people who do your residential trash. We've got uh, totes that we have. Uh, so rather having to empty individual waste cans from the uh, park shelters and things like that, uh, twice a week, the staff just rolls out the totes to the roadway and the, um, um, and the trash haulers come by and pick them up and dump them just like they would in your neighborhood and that saves a tremendous amount of time and it's very cost efficient because previously we were having to pay for a large dumpster roll off dumpster uh, to haul that trash anyway. So really it was being moved twice. Now we, we eliminate that middle step. Commissioner <clears throat> Eggers. Dave, you're muted. Thank, thank you. Sorry about that. Um, appreciate the report, Paul. Uh, it, it, and I think by now everybody knows how I feel about the parking fees, and so I won't get into that again. I see that instead of getting going down and getting off of them a little bit, we're increasing them. But okay. Uh, but I do uh, your your comment about getting the parks in better condition. Uh, especially Fred Howard Park. I've gotten calls periodically throughout the year, as I'm sure you do, about um, we're not really doing a very good job of keeping it uh, mowed and that kind of thing. And so you're, are you saying that the changes that you're doing will be addressing a lot of those, uh, what I call shortcomings? Exactly. Uh, mowing, mowing is one of those areas that uh, has been most affected uh, by the uh, um, reductions from from the Great Recession. You know, prior to 2009, uh, we were mowing once a week during the growing season. And, and of course, uh, that hasn't been possible. So what we're continually trying to do is to reduce the, uh, the gap uh, number of days in between mowing cycles. Uh, and we will continue to do that. You know, we supplement in the summer as best we can. One of the things uh, that we're doing uh, this year with our contractual staff, our, our uh, uh, temporary staff, is to assign them to our busier park locations so they're not even traveling. They're being assigned to an area so they can uh, keep up with the mowing uh, for our most visited parks. 
Well, I hope, I, I certainly hope that um, as we continue to collect parking fees that we do a little bit better job of uh, keeping those parks in good shape. Uh, for the most part, they are, but um, I think we just need to do a little bit better job on behalf of our, especially in this case, the Tarpon Springs residents uh, who visit that park. So thank you. Mr. Welch. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, let me start with the, uh, just following up on the parks issue. Um, in the opportunities for efficiencies, Paul, you talk about exploring new technology for parking management to replace some of the metering. Are we going to look at doing something to uh, improve the experience of uh, the parking payment at Fort DeSoto? which is, you know, bifurcated, will that apply to Fort DeSoto as well? Yes, exactly. And that's actually the main driver, of course, because that's where we collect the, uh, uh, the most fees and the entry station. Uh, our goal is to move to some type of um, pay by plate or similar uh, type situation where people can do it right from their phones and we don't have to stop anyone at the entry. Um, so that's that's the direction we're moving in, uh, trying to utilize uh, the available technologies that are being developed, make it simple, uh, make it effective, and also reduce the amount of cash that our, uh, our folks have to handle. Sure. That would, you still have the state stop though, that would remain? Yeah, we, the, the state stop uh, right there before you reach the Bunces Pass Bridge. Um, we have had conversations in the past with, with the state and uh, because right. of the uh, various issues that are uh, put into the state legislature, yeah. we don't have a whole lot of uh, uh, sway over that. As, well, as it's, you know. it's, it's very interesting to try to explain to constituents why they have to pay one time and then roll a few half a mile right. later and pay again. And they, they say government can't work. And it's been years we're trying to get that fixed. But I know it's not all in our hands. Um, sure. The other question I had, um, where are we on? And I don't know the technical term on the roundup situation that we were looking at. A while ago, I think you had a task force on that. Yes, and, and that that was what we referred to as the integrated vegetation management plan. Okay, uh, we we have um, uh, completed the draft of of the report. Um, as Shane mentioned, um, we have been delayed a little bit by the the um, uh, COVID restrictions because we have a lot of partners. Uh, that have been involved in that working group and trying to get everyone together. Uh, we're looking at probably 40 or, or so people to be able to uh, sit down and, and make sure that what that report does is what, um, what the intention was when the working group started. But certainly, um, you know, in a nutshell, what the report um, is, is really going to be a tool uh, with the goal to help um, agencies, municipalities within Pinellas County, as well as our, our own staff, both in parks and conservation resources and public works with an overall goal to reduce the use of all pesticides. And so what this plan does is it um, provides options. And what we hope to be able to do as an overall group in the county is to set goals for reductions in the use of pesticides. So, uh, but in terms of timeline, Commissioner, um, so next week, so I co I was co-chairing that with Jennifer Brandley of Dunedin. Uh, we're meeting with her next week um, to go over the draft report, and then we'll schedule yeah. that to come before the commissioners. Um, we wanted to make sure we did that when we had a you know an in-person meeting. So up sure. until a few days ago, we didn't know exactly when that was going to be. But they do have a draft report. They, um, the, the, all the communities come together. So from everybody from St. Pete up to Tarpon and everybody in between um, was part of that. It, it's really going to be a good guide because, you know, so Paul has um, a large staff and, and very professional people, but, you know, not everybody has that type of capability. And you're asking, um, you know, maintenance uh, folks to try to apply things and, you know, they're inconsistent in what they do. <clears throat> them coming together like that allowed them to kind of, 
create a best practices and be a guide for every community to be able to use that. And what we found, what we found in many cases is people were, you know, the, the council would say, all right, we're going to ban this. Well, if you ask the person that's actually out there doing it, what they're doing is dumping three times as much of the uh, alternative chemical. And from a science standpoint, it was actually worse for the environment than if you would have just choose the Roundup. So, you know, they, they really had to bring the folks together and kind of get a best practices guide to help folks in managing, you know, invasive species and things like that. So it, it'll be a really good best practices tool for communities to use, but we're, we're ready to roll that out. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Justice, I can't see anything this morning. <laughs> thank you, Madam Chair. Is in that work group, um, is the conversation also include the cost of manpower to physically remove if we're able to do it that way? Yeah, we look at um, with each with each alternative. Um, what we try to do is put together a a formula for calculation as to what the costs are associated with um, with each method. And of course, that's one of you know one of the things that we always look at. Of course, is safety, cost, and efficiency and effectiveness. Well, and and I guess the you know, the, the, well, I'll, I'll wait for the report, I guess, and, and we'll talk about it then. Thank you. Commissioner Seal. Uh, yes, I have several questions. Um, one is where we've not seen the environmental lands list. We were supposed to have a ranking of recreation versus mm -hmm environmental where are we on that please well, with with they we need to come back around we were going to meet with you individually on that so there i'll follow up on that i think we just kind of took up hiatus with the COVID stuff but um and, and partly raheem leaving you know now or uh that <laughs> we had two kind of things that put us a little bit behind there we, we need to come around and meet with you individually on that okay um my next question is looking at the dashboard i find it interesting um that it um, cost us about a thousand dollars an acre to maintain our parks. So um, that's the first time I've seen a figure like that. That was uh, fascinating. Um, I also know, and we talked about it yesterday, that high point on the dashboard is on hold. And again, I'm going to make my case. This is the only area in unincorporated that does not have recreational fields. And I mean, we were talking about upgrading at Seminole and doing things at other places, but at least they have fields and this area does not. So um, we really need to, I know we didn't get the state support, but we need to move forward on that. We, we are working on that. And I did confirm with Brian. So the Yucks, they went after a grant. Um, yes, it's not it, on, on the list as you, you know, pointed out, but that doesn't mean it can't come on the list and and brian is actively working on it he's just looking at a couple of different revenue sources and working with the schools um and with the uh the city on the way in which we can manage uh, the parks out there so they're actually trying to do kind of a coordinated effort to get recreation services out in that in that area okay great thank Mr. you um, if i could add if i could add also um it as, as barry mentioned we we are working towards that. As a matter of fact, we have all we've already gotten one draft conceptual plan. It's been shared with the school board. Um, as a matter of fact, I just spoke with uh, Mr. Herbick with the um, with the school board the other day. Um, you know, Brian and I have met with the city of Largo as well as the the school board or school district personnel. So we are continuing to move in that direction and. Certainly, um, the possibility of, of uh, losing the um, uh, legislative award uh, hurts, but um, we will continue to move forward with this. We'll be looking at other grants, um, whether it's through uh, the state or the federal government as well. So it's, it shouldn't be listed as on hold. That's probably just an oversight because we are moving forward with that. 
Okay. But that being said, I certainly would like some kind of timeline because this has been in the queue for as long as I can remember, at least 10 years. <clears throat> Follow up on that. Yes, sure, Long. I'm not finished yet. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, next, uh, the park road closure. How many times do we close that road? And I'm probably speaking in advance. I know the sheriff does a ride down in Fort DeSoto. So will they be subject to that fee or do we waive that? They do oh, that. We, we waive the fee for the, uh, the sheriff's ride. Uh, the fee is only applicable to those um, commercial activities um, that, um, you know, where they're making a lot of money at the inconvenience of the park users. And how often does that occur, would you say, per year? There's approximately 10 to 12 uh, events a year. Um, most of those are triathlons where they have to use the road for their biking section. Um, and although they try, we try to keep the closures to before uh, so that they're out of there by 10 a.m. Uh, sometimes if there's weather delays, that's not always possible. Okay, and then what is the reservation cancellation policy? I noticed okay. that we're increasing the fees for that as a um, per day or per occurrence. Now the reservation cancellation that's shown, the change uh, reflects the um, less than 24 hours notice for cancellation. Basically, if, if you um, had a reservation for let's say the, the weekend and you cancel on Thursday night, um, and you were re reserving it for Friday, Saturday, Sunday, you lose the first night's um, rent. If it's pre prior to that, there's only a $5 cancellation fee or a rescheduling fee. And that's only because we lose the, uh, most of the time we lose the opportunity to re-rent that campground site um, if people don't cancel at least 24 hours in advance. Okay, and my last question is, um, I noticed in the org chart, vacant lifeguards in the North District, um, uh, there's, they're all vacant. And yet when I visited Fort DeSoto Park, I did see lifeguards down there. Yeah, and, and that is just a, a timing issue. Um, actually for the first time uh, in the past three years, we have filled all of our lifeguard positions, all 25 part-time positions. So we're fully staffed at each one of our beach locations, uh, Fred Howard, uh, Sand Key, and Fort DeSoto Park. Perfect, thank you. You're thank welcome. You. Congratulations, Long. I know that's difficult. Thanks, Commissioner Long. Yes, I wanted to, thank you, Madam Chair. I wanted to echo Commissioner Seal's remarks about finding a recreation outlet in High Point. I know every year I've been on the commission, she has mentioned that. And it seems um, like there's at least an opportunity to put a finite date on making sure we take care of that. So that's number one. Number two, um, and I, I know I've already brought this up before, but I, I can't let it go how disappointed I am with the absolute raping of some of our parks under the guise of vegetation management. And I would like to know, since we're talking about it today in our budget session, if there isn't a way that we can maintain our parks with, I heard Commissioner Eggers talk about in some areas, we're not mowing enough. And then in other areas, we're stripping every single thing that makes the park pristine and just beautiful and a, a respite place for our citizens to go. It seems to me there's got to be some kind of middle ground so that we don't keep on doing that. Now, thank God we have a rainy season right here and hopefully it'll at least make all that red and barren land look green again. But honest to goodness, I can't go in that park without just being like heartbroken at how ugly it is.
I'm I'm sorry. Um, what exactly is the is the question? I'm sorry, I didn't. I understand you're not happy. I'm not happy, and thank you for understanding that. I'm not the only one. Everyone that uses those parks um, out by where I am has talked about it. And you can't go in the park without somebody coming up to you and just really ranting and raving over what were we thinking. And I'm asking what kind of a, surely there's some kind of middle ground that can be taken so that we don't have to be so incredibly extreme um, I don't see us doing that kind of thing at Booker Creek. I don't see us doing that th kind of thing at Fort DeSoto. Um, so that's my question. Surely there's a middle ground that we can take that isn't so extreme. Well, uh, certainly there, there are methods. There's other methods, but I do one want to point out we've done thousands of acres of that type of work at Brooker Creek. Um, it's imperative we do that um, just, just from a fire management, but also uh, from an ecological standpoint. Uh, the, the alternative uh, to doing that, there's two alternatives. There's manual removal, um, which would require uh, people going out there with uh, chainsaws, loppers, or chemicals, and removing the undesirable vegetation or trimming it to a certain level and then hauling it out. Um, the cost per acre of that would, would be extremely, uh, extremely high. Um, the other is prescribed burning, which we wish we could do more of, but even with, um, with the condition that a lot of the parks are in now, we couldn't effectively prescribe burn because the fuel load is so high as well, not only from a height standpoint, but also from a tonnage standpoint that it would be difficult to be able to burn that. So where we are able to burn, we burn, um, you know, but, but uh, burning can only be done under very specific weather conditions, which really limits our ability to do that. But yes, there, there are different, different methodologies, but each one of them comes with a cost. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Mr. Eggers. Uh, yeah, I was just, I, I was just looking at those um, estimated net revenue impacts for the reservation cancellation fee. Um, so I, again, I don't know what our computer system is like. I certainly understand having that cancellation fee, but I also have no interest in double booking a, a room, a, 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 a site so that if we do re-rent it, uh, that first night, you know, so, so what sending it all back to the person? Um, I mean, I, you know, I get, I get, we're trying to encourage certain behavior, but, uh, and the only other thing, you know, I guess I, you know, I continue to hear for the first four or five years I've been on the commission about since the 2008 or 2009 downturn. And, um, you know, at some point uh, that's got to get in our rear view mirror, um, you know, talk about mowing conditions or we're recovering from that. That's, you know, again, 10 years ago, we implemented parking fees to help augment some of the costs reductions. And so I just like to start seeing, you know, uh, a, a different perspective on on this, um, uh, you know, going forward. I mean, we certainly have moved on, and um, so just you know, just a comment because uh, you know you, you 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 can't keep embracing uh, embracing those times. I know we haven't fully quote recovered, and maybe there's a reason for that. So um, anyway, just a comment a comment to go. Thank you. Well, in which I was saying last year, I think, you know, they have lagged behind every other department in terms of staffing recovery, and they're adding two people this year, right? Am I right in that? One and a half, but, um, one, one and a half. but, but Commissioner, to your point, I mean, they're doing this, the staffing study is a direct result from the commissioners last year questioning whether we have sufficient staffing. And so there's no, there's no, you know, mandate from me or anybody else to say that, you know, we shouldn't be adding more people or anything like that. We're saying 
let's look at the service levels that were provided. Um, if we need to add people, we're going to add people. The issue is how best to accomplish that. Frankly, I think the bathrooms are like are, are one of the bigger deals, getting people doing what we hire them to do um, and, and maybe outsourcing some of that. And, and there's so so that's that's part of that report that we're going to bring back. They wanted it to be done. They just got behind. Um, but we, we wanted it to be done as part of this budget cycle um, to be able to address the concerns that you guys raised with the level of service at our parks. Right. You seem to be talking about the same things year after year, though. So anyway, any, anything else about parks and conservation resources? Keep wanting to say parks and rec, but um, recreation report. Recreation report is one of those other items that's going to come right. back to you. And we're going to have a conversation about what is our uh, level of involvement <laughs> with recreation and, and how to how to do that consistently throughout the county. So that, that's another report that's in progress. I think we'll get to it this year. We will. <laughs> we, I, I was hoping all three of these would be done before, yeah, <laughs> before this budget. Right. And um, I, We've been a little focused on something else, but <coughs> yeah. So, so they are working on it though. Okay, great. Anything else for parks and conservation resources? Okay, thank you. Thank you, commissioners. All right, now you can be really tough on the next budget. Um, that's <laughs> the management and budget. All right. Um, I don't agree with that, by the way. <laughs> I'm Cecilia McCorkle. I'm the uh, budget analyst for our office, Office of Management and Budget. I'm presenting today along with Aubrey Phillips, who is our strategic performance management analyst for our office, and Bill Berger, our director, is with us as well. So I'm going to turn it over to Aubrey to get started on performance. Good morning, commissioners. Thank you for having me. Again, I'm Aubrey Phillips. Um, so I wanted to start by sharing with you, um, you've received these attachments for each of the departments of their performance summaries. Um, these are screenshots of what is an online dashboard. So I wanted to demonstrate that for you because that's how we're going to be um, presenting the budget or the performance information as part of the budget this year, um, rather than printing it in a document where as soon as it's printed, it's out of date. Um, each department will have a link to a page where their performance information is updated. Um, as you caught with parks, this has been a new process for the entire county and getting everyone familiar with a new process when you've got a staff as large as we do takes some time. So appreciate your patience in working through the kinks and bringing things to our attention. Um, but what this allows us to do is embed a lot more information about each of the performance measures and our analysis of it um, right within the page. So for instance, on Hurricane Firm, Firm Irma FEMA reimbursement, you can see the trend over time and the current uh, rate that we're at on our reimbursement. And then if you click into the view measure, you see a specific page where there's more detail on the analysis of uh, what's been going on and what explains the performance we're seeing and any um, action that's being taken to address any gaps in performance. So again, this is a new process for us, so we appreciate your feedback, um, but we feel like this is one, a way to automate uh, performance reporting, get you more uh, regular updates on how we're doing on different projects so that we can continue to have these kinds of um, accountability conversations. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now so that um, Cecilia can pull up our budget analysis, but I'll keep speaking to uh, OMB's performance summary. So OMB uh, has been refining current processes, as I mentioned, and leveraging technology to automate uh, processes that have typically been manual for us. Um, I showed you just now the collection and publication of performance data um, that we're automating through the use of Socrata. Also through our uh, budget uh, software implementation, we're working to uh, refine and automate processes related to development of the six-year forecast, user fees, uh, quarterly status reports, and budget amendments. So those efficiencies are really important in OMB because they really allow us to focus the team's time and energy on analysis and the more value-added aspects of our role uh, rather than in filling gaps with current technology. 
The department is developing new performance measures related to general fund revenues, capital improvement program, and grants. Um, and the intent there with many of the BCC departments that we've been sharing with you is to really provide a more complete picture of the department's performance outcomes. As many of you are aware, OMB's had a significant role in supporting COVID-19 uh, response. In addition to the work that all of the analysts have been doing uh, to update revenue projections and engaging departments to understand and capture COVID-19 impacts to budget and performance, staff from OMB have also been supporting the EOC finance section uh, with FEMA documentation, EOC planning section in the situation unit re uh, reports that you've been receiving, and CARES Act program development and public engagement. So with all of those um, additional roles related to COVID response, as you can imagine, that has had impacts in other areas. Um, the only work plan item that's uh, been put on hold uh, directly as a result of COVID-19 have been negotiations with the Clearwater Tourist Development Tax uh, Capital Funding Request. Um, however, other uh, Work plan initiatives continue forward. Uh, we are adjusting the timeline for the multi-year countywide strategic plan update uh, based on the evolving nature of the impacts surrounding COVID. Um, we have provided the summary analysis for the uh, levels of service for parks operations and are looking forward to bringing you back a full report and recommendations in July for consideration. Um, and then we're also uh, Pleased to share that we've continued to work with the state on uh, complete 100% validation of the documentation related to Hurricane Irma. Um, it's continued to be a work in progress, but as a result of this investment that we've made working with um, our partners at the federal government, the reimbursement we've received increased significantly from about 20% in February up to almost 67% in March. So we'll continue that work. As you all are aware, OMB uh, has been involved over the past several years on a number of process improvement projects related to the customer experience. We have seen abandoned rates at county operated call centers stay below our target of five to 8% that's based on industry best practice. However, we have seen that gradually uh, increase over the last two years as our average wait times have uh, inched up. Uh, we do follow up with individual departments to help them address those performance gaps. We discuss this data as part of a regular performance discussion with county administration and department leadership um, to share best practices and learn from one another. However, in the long term, it's really expected that a tra the transition to a centralized customer service center will really help to consolidate responsibility for this area of county performance. Um, in April, we saw for the first time, or since... Uh, for the first time since April 2018, I'm sorry, uh, the countywide voice of the customer overall satisfaction dropped below 85% in March and April of 2020. We also saw the, the a, a decrease in the number of responses we've received, and that uh, is likely what's responsible for the decline in the um, overall satisfaction. We're just not getting the number of people responding to the survey that we typically would have um, up until February, or March and April of this year. We've seen month over month um, increases from the prior year in the number of responses we're getting. Um, we do continue to monitor and analyze these trends. However, we're also working to evaluate and revise our existing internal customer survey instruments, um, really to, to focus on improving the quality and the actionability of the data we're getting out of those surveys so that our um, internal service departments are getting the feedback they need to respond effectively. Um, we have uh, postponed the uh, transition to a centralized customer service center initiative kickoff uh, because of key team members um, being focused on COVID-19 response. However, we're continuing to move forward um, to put that uh, project together and bring that back to you all. So that is it for the performance updates and I'll pass it back to Cecilia to take us in with budget summary. Mute. So as you see here on our budget summary, um, our department's mostly personal services, about 98% of our budget for FY21 is personal services. From tw the 20 budget to FY21, we're looking at about a $274,000 decrease. And the majority of this is contributed to uh, a reduction in FTE. If you look at the staffing summary, 
uh, just below our budget summary, you'll see we had a net decrease of four FTE. We had actually five FTE realigned from OMB to admin services uh, back in early calendar year or late December of last year. Um, that was our operating accounts payable team in, in OMB. They provided centralized account payable services to multiple county departments. They're still performing that function over in administrative services. At the same time of that realignment from those FTE over to admin services, one of their FTE was transferred over to OMB to provide full service budget analyst duties for administrative services. So we had a net of four FTE decrease for FY21. Also contributing to our decrease, we had two employees retire um, already this fiscal year. Both of those positions were double encumbered and also had leave payouts. Those were non-recurring costs, so those aren't going to show up in the FY21 request, so that's contributing to our decrease. Um, offsetting some of that overall decrease is the um, increase for the exempt phase of the paying class study. That paying class study, the results of that came in a little too late last year to be able to program into the FY20 budget. So that's why you see um, a little bit of an increase in those positions. Um, so it offsets some of that overall decrease we have from the realignment of those FTE. And our operating and uh, operating expenses and capital outlay, you'll see we decreased uh, almost $40,000 in those areas. The majority of that is attributed to consulting services. Uh, we had $30,000 in our budget in case we needed a technical consultant. Uh, we used that in prior years to bring in trainee, uh, trainers to our department to be able to um, expand our knowledge on uh, Oracle projects accounting specifically. Um, we are not using that in FY20, so we've removed it from our budget from 21 because we don't anticipate doing that next year as well. Um, included in the $65,000 in operating that you see there, about $15,000 of that are computer replacements, and those are following the BTS recommended schedule for replacements. And we also have about twenty dollars to $25,000 for travel and training and other uh, miscellaneous operating. We don't expect any direct uh, impacts to our budget as a relate, uh, excuse me, as a result of COVID-19. And I will turn it over to Bill. Well, thank you, Celia and Aubrey. Um, I don't really have a whole lot to uh, offer at this point, other than I just do want to, uh, first of all, thank the board for being so supportive of OMB and facilitating the budget process each year. Um, your feedback is incredibly valuable and on point and um, you always have insightful questions and they always lead us to uh, making improvements in the process. So we're very appreciative of that. Um, I do want to acknowledge the entire staff in OMB. Um, you know, through this pandemic, uh, you heard Aubrey mention a whole lot of different things that we're doing that are not normal activities. And they're doing that in the midst of fulfilling all the required statutory uh, things that we do uh, related to budget development and also other services that we provide. And on top of that, we're also implementing a new budget software that Celia is leading along with Jason Rivera, Aubrey and her team implementing Socrata, and doing all of that while teleworking. Um, almost our entire team has actually been telecommuting for the past two and a half, three months. I've actually lost track, it's been so long. Um, I haven't even physically seen face-to-face -face most of the staff in that time, but um, you wouldn't know it based on the productivity of the staff. So um, I just want to thank and acknowledge and credit all of them for continuing to do a great job and uh, demonstrating that uh, being physically present doesn't mean that you're not going to actually do a great job. And it's a new model that we think is actually working remarkably well and hopefully will inform what our needs are from a staff, from an office perspective in the future, which is similar to what Barry talked about with the space study yesterday. Um, and then also I want to thank all of our partners in the departments and agencies. Um, we're providing services to them, but we can't do that effectively without the partnership that we have with them. And uh, they've been incredibly supportive as well and understanding where sometimes staff have been pulled away and had to transition into other duties. And uh, Jim is an example of that this morning, uh, working on PCR um, Jim had minimal involvement in actually developing that budget, 
Um, but due to a retirement that we just recently had, somebody had to pick up the ball and run with it. And Jim did a great job of doing that. So um, just continue teamwork and uh, you know, thank you to the departments for understanding when we need to make those transitions because those can be difficult for them as well. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Mr. Welch. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Bill, I just wanted to um, thank you and your team just for setting the standard of excellence um, for several years uh, in Pinellas County. Um, and you got a much better background today as well, much brighter, uh, sir. I'll compliment you <laughs> on that. Um, what's, the, what's the status of Questica? Are we using it for this FY21 budget development? I'll actually uh, let Cecilia answer that because she's actually leading that project and she'll be able to give you a much better answer than the generic one I would give you. Okay. Uh, right now we're on track for going live later in the summer. So uh, the fun part of this budget year is that we were actually going to be using both softwares at some point by the time we adopt the budget. Um, the preliminary budget development that you're seeing now was developed in Hyperion and then our proposed budget will be through uh, Hyperion. Um, we're hoping to go live fully uh, with Questica in August, and so our adopted budget we're anticipating uh, producing through Questica. We'll still continue to maintain Hyperion as we move along because, you know, with any software we may have, I, I don't mean go along this year, not, <laughs> right, not right. far past that, but okay. um, you know, just in case we have some hiccups along the way with Questica that we need to make sure we work out the kinks. We don't want to put all our eggs in one basket too soon. So that has been a challenge this year is kind of managing the timing between the transition from one to the other. So we should be using both in a couple of months and then transition off of Hyperion uh, for FY22 development. Okay. And do you need uh, consultant services for, uh, for Questica moving forward or will it be internal? How, how will that work? Well, part of the contract was a subscription because it's a cloud service. So it's uh, software as a solution. So we have part of the contract includes, um, I believe three years automatically included of that of, um, of service to go along with that with the option to extend for two additional years if we would like to do that. Okay. All right, thank you so much. You're welcome. Commissioner Seal. Uh, thank you. Um, well, Commissioner Welch um, jumped in first. Thank you, Commissioner. But I do want to commend you on um, excellent budget presentations. And I know that you all have been wearing lots of hats in OMB and the strategic planning and, you know, getting surveys done and all kinds of things that were unexpected. Um, I actually think the presentation for the budget this year is excellent. We've had more information than we've ever than we've had for a few years. So um, it's all the dashboard. I uh, know it takes a lot of time to update and maintain that, but it's um, it's all very good. My only question is, um, you moved the accounts payable to administrative services. What department is administrative services in? <laughs> Administrative services is actually a department and it's comprised of what used to be known as purchasing, real estate okay. management, and risk management. We, we consolidated that under Joe Laurel. So he's got um, you know, risk, purchasing, and facilities. Got it. Thank you. Hey, Barry, related to that, um, would it be possible for us to get a new org chart that has uh, at least names down to the director level. Absolutely. I'm, yeah, we'll, we'll I have a hard time up. keeping track of who's doing what these days. Sure. A absolutely. We'll, we'll get right. to that. And, and also, I know sure everybody's doing a great job, but I just want to know what they're doing. Yeah, we'll they're also doing. give you their cell phone number in case they're not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Uh, Commissioner Eggers. Yeah. Uh, thank you for that. That's a great thing because, you know, with, with Barry, uh, allowing us to chat with the directors and such. It's nice to know where they all fit in and things. So I really, that's a great idea. Um, I also wanted to commend Bill and you, your group, Aubrey, Cecilia, this morning for your presentation. I do think that you all set a pretty high standard for, for all of our departments in terms of uh, performance, accountability, and that kind of thing. Um, so I, I really appreciate it. I really like the approach this year. Um, I do like the different set of eyes on each department. I think it just gives, you know, perspective that uh, many 
you know, folks that are operating day to day may not see as clearly. And so together, I think it really works well. So really like that. And, and Bill, maybe you could just talk briefly, kind of refresh my memory because um, on the centralized customer service, what's your hope, what your hope is from that and what that scope is just briefly. I'll actually ask Aubrey to uh, do that because that falls under her purview in terms of helping to manage that project. Okay, thanks. Certainly. Uh, so thank you for the commission, uh, the question, Commissioner Eggers. Um, so the the uh, transition to a cu centralized customer service center, what we are uh, exploring is uh, we are looking at bringing a consultant on board to help with that transition because we know that from peers we've talked through that have talked to who have gone through similar efforts. Um, having that kind of guidance of people who've been there, done that, uh, is, is a big differentiator between success and, and not. Um, however, the specific scope of what we're looking at is BCC departments and gradual consolidation of the different call centers across BCC departments. Right now, um, when I talked with you about managing the performance on those uh, department call centers, we've got roughly 13 just within BCC departments. Um, and you can imagine, you know, as soon as you get one performance gap resolved, um, another pops up. So we really, you know, bringing that together under centralized leadership that really has that focus on the customer experience. Um, and the, the vision is that it would first consolidate call center operations, but gradually become a, a centralized customer service center uh, where C-click fix requests were, are processed, uh, live chat is responded to. Okay, thank you. I, yeah, I remember liking what I remember from it last year. And when you said that again, I just think that's going to be great for our residents. So um, I know we're a little behind on that, but uh, I, I look forward to that, uh, to those efforts. Thank you. I, I, and I know that, and I appreciate everyone's patience in the timeline. I will just say one of the reasons why we're going with this gradual transition is we want to make sure that we don't lose the, the technical expertise and subject matter expertise of our current call center. So we're, we're engaging those staff to make sure that they're part of the process and that we learn from their, their experience. And, and commissioners, that, that's a big piece of this. I, you know, even for myself and Aubrey you know, didn't want to throw me under the bus, but I, I, I was really questioning that because sometimes, you know, you consolidate and you put two and then you don't have the technical expertise to be able to, and you end up transferring people around and things like that. We want to make sure that, that we, um, you know, it's not just an efficiency issue, but it's an effectiveness. Um, we have the right level of service. There may be areas where it is very technical and we shouldn't have that under a single call and those calls get directed straight over to that area or something. I just want to make sure that we, we have the right balance when we're moving towards a consolidated center. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't want, I don't want to, you know, get somebody off. No, nope, I can't help you. I got to transfer you over here. And um, we, that's reason for that outside review. Yeah. That's a great point. You know, you don't want to be bounced around, but you'd also want to get the right information. So it's a, it's a yeah. delicate balance, but uh, appreciate that effort. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else for OMB? Yes. Commissioner Seal. Just um, a question as to the call center. Will this lead us to a 311 number? Because I know we talked about that in the past. That's not, I, go ahead, Aubrey. Yes, I was going to say, uh, we, we did review the documentation and efforts that have been done in the past. Um, we recognize that trying to get the cross agency coordination uh, has been a challenge and a hurdle in the past. So uh, our intent is to focus on the BCC departments. If there's opportunities uh, down the road to engage other government agencies and make it more of a complete county 311, um, then we can explore that. But our focus is on um, making sure that if they're trying to reach a county department, that they can just call one number and get the answer they need quickly. Okay, anything else? If not, let's right. move on to the tax collector. Good morning. My name is Don Mello. I'm with the Office of Management and Budget. Um, we'll be reviewing tax collector's budget. Um, Mr. Charles W. Thomas, also known as Carlos, is here with us today to also answer any questions. Um, Good, morning. Time, I'm gonna go. <laughs> Good morning. I'm going to go ahead and try to share my screen. Uh, so we're all viewing the same document. Can everybody see that? No. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, 
Sorry. There we go. How's that? Yep. There we go. Thank You're you. Good. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Is it blurry? Okay. Um, so, in addition, the, the tax collector uh, bills, collects, and distributes all the taxes for the county. Um, in addition, they act as an agent for two areas of, the, uh, of Florida. Um, the Florida Department of Highway and Safety and Motor Vehicles in a Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. Um, they issue um, the hunting licenses and the driver's license ID cards, uh, titles and reg registrations. Um, so they, they have a, a lot of activities going on. Um, so their budget is supported by commission fees that are um, outlined, in, um, outlined in Florida statute. Um, the the uh, calculation is set um, by statutory formula. And as the, his total request this year is $29,200,000, dollars um, So the, the commissions that impact the general fund are shown in this table. Um, the total general fund portion um, that will be used to support this total budget is $22,892,000 an increase of $953,000. Um, any, un any unused uh, commissions that, uh, that they are returned in proportion to um, the payers, um, this year we anticipate a return of $8.4 million, an increase of $396,000. Um, the tax collector submits their budget to the state of Florida, um, and it is approved. It's due on August 1st. Uh, the, um, the, the um, his, the total budget was also uh, did meet the target that was set this year, so it was lower than the inflationary uh, increases that we expected. Um, the budget supports 281 positions, which is unchanged from last year. Um, and although the, there are no COVID impacts um, incorporated into the budget, um, Mr. Thomas shared a, a lot of explorations that he's been looking at that may enhance service delivery going forward, given COVID-19. Um, at this time, I'll turn it over to you, Mr. Thomas. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Oh, good, good. Got a lot of echo going on here. Mm. Mr. Thomas, you're definitely getting some feedback. Um, do you have a, two mics on or, um, or something of that nature? No. Yeah. Just my mic. Charles, you might try to turn down your speakers a little bit. Actually, I have my speakers completely turned down. We're going to send somebody up there, sir. Let's try now. Ah, there we go. Much better. Sounds better. We'll get the other computer turned down now. So good morning, uh, members of the Board of County Commissioners. Good morning, uh, County Administrator Burton. I'd like to say that I'm pleased that we have a budget which, um, in addition to being uh, proper for the operation of the tax collector's office, will also meet the target set by the Office of Management and Budget under the direction of the Board of County Commissioners. I'd like to thank the board for the opportunity to work together on our new South County facility. Uh, that should be coming uh, available mid-July. We are extremely excited about this. It will allow us to uh, serve the residents in the south part of the county at a, uh, an enhanced level of service there. I'd also like to thank County Administrator Burton and the real estate uh, management group for their work, which will provide a dedicated driving range in the north part of the county later this month. I thought I'd go through a few things um, about uh, operations and how they've affected us and some plans uh, related to COVID. Um, as you know, in uh, the third week of March, we ceased 
seeing the public face to face. Yet we maintained our call center opened and we, our back office operations kept moving. We processed mail, internet renewals, uh, dealer work, um, and answered thousands upon thousands of phone calls. Our Mid-County branch reopened to the public by appointment mid-May. The courthouse opened to the public last week. Our North County branch reopened by appointment Monday, June 1. The Gulf to Bay branch is set to reopen by appointment Monday, June 8th. Our Skyway branch is set to reopen by appointment Tuesday, June 9th. Again, we, we expect the North County driving range to come on board by the end of June. In our new South County, we're gonna wait for the new South County office to open in the new building. It will be by appointment and it has a dedicated uh, dual course driving range and that should be uh, finished beginning to mid-July. We um, are also right now uh, having kiosks deployed to all of our lobbies for our branches, plus at this point, two Publix locations in Pinellas County. That'll provide on-demand uh, registration renewals, be able to get your decal, and we should be announcing that to the public within the next few weeks. We'd like to get them installed, uh, shake them down, make sure they're working properly before we did that. Probably one of the biggest challenges we faced with COVID was with our call center, which is probably not unusual to call centers in general. Our call center is designed to handle about 25,000 calls per month, which is typically our volume other than November when we would hit about 32,000 calls. In the month of May alone, 75,000 calls came to the call center. Uh, I apologize we couldn't answer all those folks, but we were just frankly overwhelmed. And, um, but we anticipate with the reopening of the branch offices, we be believe that call volumes will begin to stabilize. I have a little bit of information I'd like to share with you um, about the tax certificate sale. There was a question uh, about a month and a half ago about delinquent taxes and, uh, and how that might be handled. And I responded suggesting that the tax certificate sale was uh, the proper vehicle to deal with delinquent taxes. Um, that it is a, uh, a process that allows for homeowners to be given time to pay their taxes and have that paid by an investor at a competitive rate. It uh, gets the money into the hands of government for uh, essential services and um, gives investors an opportunity. So we held our tax certificate sale uh, last weekend. We offered 12,493 tax certificates the face value of those certificates was $41,263,000 and change. Only $20,187 were struck to the county. That's 0.05% of the total offered. We sold 99.5% of the certificates. 94% of those were at 0.25% interest rate with an overall rate of 0.94%. So I think um, folks that needed that, that vehicle to pay their taxes, have their taxes paid and um, keep their homes safe through uh, at least April of 2022, worked very, very well. And um, I understand there were some questions as well about the uh, when tax uh, bills and would be noticed uh, when those would be sent out, how that works. Under uh, Florida Statute 197.322, uh, the uh, tax collector shall, within 20 working days after receipt of the certified ad valorem tax roll and the non ad valorem assessment roll, shall send to each taxpayer being on such rolls whose address is known to him notice of taxes due. So basically, within 20 days of the property appraiser delivering the certified tax roll to the tax collector, we, we would send out the bills. Um, 
and, and again, that's the tax collector shall do that. Uh, partial payments. There are partial payment uh, met, uh, available under 197.374. And um, the tax collector may accept one or more partial payments on any amount per parcel for payment of current taxes and assessments, as long as such payment is made prior to the date of delinquency. A prepayment of estimated taxes is covered under 197.222, and that's the installment plan. To be eligible for that, you need to apply for that by April 30th of um, folks who are on it this year needed to be on by April 30th. And the reason for that is the first installment bill was sent out and collected on, began collection June 1. And uh, last, uh, delinquent personal property taxes. Is there a payment plan for businesses? And under 197. Four one five five. A county tax collector may implement a payment prog program for the payment of delinquent personal property taxes. Um, usually, that will happen at the tax warrant hearing. I believe that is next month in court, and that process is generally approved by the judge presiding over the tax warrant hearing. That is. Uh, that's what I have other than whatever questions you may have for me that I'll try to answer. You're on mute, Madam Chair. Commissioner Welch. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Tax Collector, thank you for your presentation and all your great work. Uh, looking forward to your South County office opening up. Uh, wondered if you could just talk a little bit, I saw you on a news program talking about the remote driver testing, <laughs> which I thought was really interesting. Could you just talk yeah. about that for a minute? Uh, yes, Commissioner Welsh, I'll be happy to. Um, and this is why we're so excited about having the North County Driving Range and the, and the range on site at South County offices. We'll be able to offer driving tests to those who need a, uh, a test of that type and do that remotely. We're gonna ask for the driver to come in with a, another driver, 21 years of older or older with a valid driver's license. We'll be providing either a cell phone or a tablet to give direction to the passenger who can relay that properly to the driver and observe that test to make sure that they're able to accomplish the tasks and um, complete a driving test. This will allow uh, the test uh, the pe person who comes in for the test not to be in vehicle in close proximity to someone they don't know. And it will also prevent um, our customer service reps from needing to get into a, a vehicle that, um, that they're unfamiliar with and with, with folks because you're basically shoulder to shoulder in the car, right? Right, right. So um, this is being done up in uh, Scambia County. The tax collector up there said that they're having uh, almost identical pass fail rates as they do um, on um, drivers and, and, and testers in the same car, the old, the old way of doing things. Um, so we're looking forward to that. I think that's probably going to be testing going forward. I remember on the newscast, uh, the young lady asked, uh, but I don't know if this made the air. Well, does that, um, is, is that in conflict with uh, not using a, a cell phone while you're, while you're driving. <laughs> and I said, well, no, it, it's not. You're on a controlled range right. and, and the passenger would be the one relaying that. <laughs> uh, we're not putting you out on US 19 to do this. Right. <laughs> it would be in a very controlled situation. I, I got news yesterday that uh, the department, uh, the Florida Highway Patrol may allow us until we can get these other ranges up, the use of their range in, in Pinellas Park. That was the range we were supposed to get about five years ago and didn't right. get. Um, so we may be able to go ahead and begin doing those tests. Well, it's very, very innovative and uh, looking forward to it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Commissioner Welch. Uh, Commissioner Seal. Yes, thank you very much um, for all of your good work and your staff. Um, the delinquent, the, cer the certificate sale, was that up substantially from previous years as the numbers and the dollar amounts? Just kind of curious. Not really. Um, it was up a little bit over last year. 
Um, let me pull up my phone where I got, I have the email on that. Um, actually, I know last year was somewhere uh, north of 11,500 tax certificates offered. We were at 12.5. I can remember when I started in the office 20 years ago, uh, offering anywhere from 20 to 25,000 tax certificates. So I think the last few years, the economy has really uh, benefited the ability to collect taxes current and delinquencies have been fairly low. Okay, thank you. How few certificates were struck to the county? I mean, 0.05%. I don't know if I've ever seen it lower. Hmm. Thank you. Any other questions for Carlos? Okay, then. Great. Uh, Commissioners, if, uh, if we're done with that one, I do want to bring, if we can, Brian in because I want to jump back to the issue of High Point and um, because I think we we're, were having some miscommunication, I, you know, because it does list it as, as on hold, uh, but but I wanted Brian to kind of brief you on that uh, so you can hear firsthand. They are working and progressing on that, but let Brian give you an update. Commissioner Brian Loak, Assistant County Administrator for Central and Southern Pinellas County. Um, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. I wanted to let you know we are moving forward with that project. Um, uh, Paul and I have met with a firm that they've created a conceptual design for that facility. Uh, we've provided our feedback um, we've received feedback from the school board, the school district. Um, we're incorporating that. Next step is to go to the city of Largo, get their input on that design. We'll then find, firm up um, what their commitment and involvement to the project will be. Once we have that, we, we're working on a draft agreement to take to the uh, school board. Once they approve it, it'll come back to you. And at that point, we'll have a project. As far as funding goes, we're looking to use penny for panelist dollars, as you saw yesterday. CDBG dollars, as well as a uh, state dollars. We do have $500,000 in the final state budget, and we're working to make sure it stays there uh, when the governor signs the budget. And explain how you're working with Largo, what that's about. So with the city of Largo, um, uh, our involvement with, with the city, uh, both in High Point and Ridgecrest, is really we're looking to form a, a good relationship there. There's a lot of services that folks need in both those communities. And we, we really want to work with the city um, to make sure we bring those services to those residents as quickly as possible um, in, in a partnership uh, manner. So we've sat down with the city, city staff and they are interested in working with us on this um, to what degree we haven't firmed up yet. Uh, but we do want to make sure they've, they've had some plans for quite some time to um, the, the, the trail will be running through High Point. Uh, in the future, and they were looking to uh, create a, a trailhead there. This is right next to that. Um, so this is a great opportunity, really a catalyst uh, project for that community and uh, the relationship between us and the city uh, with the, the residents of High Point. So whether that's going to be ma operation and maintenance, um, whether that's going to be capital, we don't, we're not there yet. We're working on that, and we hope to have an answer soon. Great. Thank you, Brian. It's good news. All right. Um, Thanks. Okay. Any no other questions? Then uh, county attorney. <clears throat> Thank you, Brian. Um, good morning. Um, my name is Yana Matiuk. I'm the budget analyst for the county attorney's office. Um, let me share the presentation with you. Are you able to see that? Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, so starting off with opportunities for efficiencies for the department. The uh, department purchased an FY20, uh, two copiers. Uh, the decision was uh, made in favor of leasing the copiers uh, because um, over the seven year period of time, it is estimated that uh, a little over $30,000, close to $31,000 uh, will be saved um, going that route. Um, the, the office continually values the necessity of all the expenses requested in the budget and makes the necessary adjustments. Um, potential threats, new laws and bills. I will defer that section to Jewel. She will be able to um, discuss that in uh, more detail and um, uh, discuss the litigations um, issues and um, 
the possible um, actions that her office might be taking. Jewel? Uh, good morning, commissioners. Um, under, under the threats, which I guess I would characterize more as challenges, um, as with any presidential election year, we do anticipate greater litigation that we would be handling for the supervisor of elections. And we are in fact already handling um, some cases for the supervisor and for the canvassing board. Um, so those lawsuits are already underway. Um, in addition to just the litigation that we handle, uh, which we do expect to, to see, see a bit more this year, um, we also provide a great deal of support, um, non-litigation to the canvassing board. Um, Commissioner Gerard, I know that we'll be seeing you there. Most of the commissioners have had the opportunity to sit with the canvassing board and are, are aware of the role that my office plays in providing that support. And, you know, as mentioned, with it being a presidential year, that will be a, a good bit of support that we'll be providing um, and are very happy to do. Um, we do anticipate and have, in fact, already seen lawsuits filed as a result of COVID. Um, you all are aware of the lawsuits that we have seen thus far. They've been um, related to business closures, essentially. Um, there is a growing trend around the country already of lawsuits related to business damages as a result of those closures. We hope to not see those, but we're certainly um, looking forward and, and foreseeing those as a potential impact uh, from COVID. Um, just speaking about COVID, all the things that you've heard, um, the departments under the county administrator already mentioned that they've been doing in support of COVID. We have been working with the departments hand in hand and providing uh, legal support. Um, and as you're aware, have been you know, very involved along the way in drafting some of the orders that you all have seen. Uh, so we have done, you know, obviously quite a bit in support of COVID. Um, we have a couple of other things listed there, but the litigation in regard to COVID and, and the uh, presidential election are really the major issues that I would see as having an impact um, as we go into fiscal year 2021. Thank you, Jill. Um, moving forward, there is a budget summary table uh, that presents the FY17 actuals through FY21 requested budget um, and the revenue summary as well as the staffing summary. I will refer to some of the information on these tables um, later on in my discussion for the budget highlights. Um, County Attorney's Office does not have user fees, uh, nor the decision packages for FY21. The total expenditures for the office are increasing by $226,000. Um, personal services reflect a net increase of roughly $300,000 or 6.2% for FY21. This is primarily attributed to the <clears throat> Evergreen study changes, um, as well as planning for potential promotions for eligible attorneys um, and countywide inflationary inc increases. Um, you will also see the FY20 estimate exceeding the FY20 budget by roughly $150,000. And again, this is largely due to the impacts of the Evergreen um, study. Operating expenditures for the department are decreasing by about $100,000. And this is primarily due to the outside legal counsel program uh, decreases, um, again, $100,000 uh, to better align expenditures with the historical spending trend in that program. Uh, there is also a decrease of $9,000 in rentals and leases line, um, again, to stay consistent. And as I have already mentioned, um, because the department purchased the uh, copiers, the leases line is no longer needed for FY21, so we are burning it down. Um, operating supplies expenditures are increasing by $32,000. Uh, the department continues to replace the uh, damaged office furniture. Uh, this amount is for 10 offices being replaced at approximately $4,000 uh, per office. Uh, there are other minor uh, decreases within this um, account line. So the uh, overall increase for the operating supplies um, is $32,000. As far as the expenditure impacts from the COVID-19, uh, there are none um, expected. So the operating expenditure for both FY20 estimate and 21 budget um, are not expected to be impacted. Um, capital outlay is increased by roughly $27,000 for FY21, and this is primarily due to the um, BTS the, um, PC replacement plan. So to replace 20 PC, uh, PCs for the office, uh, these costs and um, schedule is consistent, what BTS provides us, and the expenditures vary year over year. 
Um, the revenue is based on legal services, including research, drafting, and consultation in relation to the clerk's duties as ministerial clerk to the court. And I will go back to the table. We um, haven't been budgeting these revenues in the past because of uh, very unpredictable nature of these revenues. However, we have noticed that, uh, yes, we are receiving the revenue. These are the transfers. And um, um, we went ahead and uh, budgeted for FY20 estimate and FY21 request. They are minimal revenues, um, but we wanted to capture them regardless. Um, that is all that I have for the department. Jill, do you have anything to add? Um, I don't. I'm happy to uh, answer any questions that um, anybody may have. I will note um, for the commissioners um, who are also members of the County Attorney Oversight Committee um, that I know, I believe a hold, uh, hold the date has been um, sent out, I think, by Whitney, and I do plan on sending out a memo uh, next week. Um, similar to what you all have seen in the past. It's going to just be a single memo, so I apologize. It's going to be a little bit lengthier than what you're used to seeing because I had been sending those out twice a year. Uh, so, it'll, so it will be a little bit lengthier because it's just one for this year, but that'll be going out next week. Um, just discussing some of the things that we've done uh, since last we met last summer. Uh, a lot of discussion of just sort of the things that we've done to support um, the various client bases in regard to COVID and just other things that we do throughout the year. So uh, keep your eyes out for that next week. Thank you. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions anyone has. Questions for Jewel? I don't see any. We're pretty simple. We're, we're all people. Um, <laughs> we're all people in outside counsel. I will tell you, um, I worked with Yana and, and uh, OMB staff this year. We did realign, as Yana mentioned, the outside counsel um, uh, appropriation down from 300 to 200 because that really aligns more with what we have spent the last couple years. Um, outside counsel is obviously something that varies and is unpredictable. Um, I just asked my office manager before this meeting, it looks like we may exceed the 200,000 this fiscal year. Um, we have 300 in this fiscal year's budget, so it won't be an issue, but just, you know, I just note that to, to show that it is a bit unpredictable. Um, the last years where we really saw a big spike in expenditures is when we were handling the Richmond Group litigation. Uh, since then, though, we really have been down uh, $200,000 or less. And just to give you all um, some insight into what those costs go to, um, this year in particular, we have uh, some construction, uh, some cases in litigation related to some construction projects. That's a, a very highly specialized field of litigation. We do not attempt to handle that in-house because it's just not expertise that we need every day. Uh, so we don't keep it in-house. And it also tends to be very... Um, document review intensive. Again, something that you really have to staff up for and not, and not something that we need to keep staff in house for. Uh, generally speaking, the only other things that we uh, send litigation out for are those specialized areas that we just don't have in house expertise or when we do happen upon a conflict. So Julie, we do have a question or comment after all. Commissioner Welch? Well, I didn't want you to feel slighted. Uh, <laughs> Um, and this might be better for the supervisor of elections, but just on the um, mail voting issue, are you aware of any lawsuits or any? Yes. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Um, some of the ones that we're involved in right now, I can tell you um, we are not unique. The lawsuits have all 67 counties involved, all 67 canvassing boards involved, as well as parties at the state of Florida. Um, I know that you all have already seen a request from our, our supervisor of elections, Julie Marcus, uh, to pay for postage um, for the return envelopes for mail ballots. And that is something that they are trying to compel through the lawsuit. Our supervisor wants to offer that anyway. Um, I know, again, that those of you that have sat on, sit on the canvassing board in the past know that we have a very robust mail ballot program here in Pinellas County already. We have for a number of years. Um, I know that the supervisor Marcus is also uh, looking to increase the ballot drop off sites so that there are additional locations for voters in Pinellas County to choose to drop off their ballots. Um, again, it might be a question for her, but she has gone through a number of um, steps to make those sites very secure. And there are chain of custody requirements and all sorts of things that they put in place to make sure that those ballot drop off sites are very secure uh, so that voters can have the utmost confidence in dropping those ballots off. Um, but that coupled with um, 
you know, an appropriation for the return postage really will put voters in Pinellas County in a very, very good place uh, to feel comfortable voting by mail. Yeah, and everyone knows we've led the way under Deb Clark with, you know, mail voting, very secure, very um, convenient for folks all across the county. So I'm glad to hear that. And, um, but you mentioned, so this lawsuit is in support of mail voting. It's not restricting. No, absolutely okay. not. No, it's been filed by, I mean, I guess I'll call them voter advocacy groups okay. um, that are seeking, you know, I'm just going to pat ourselves on the back and say, seeking to have other counties do what we've done here in Pinellas County for a number of years already. Okay. But again, okay. we're, we're in there with all 67 counties and all 67 canvassing boards. So I don't think that Pinellas County in particular is a county that anybody has um, any issues with. Again, we're just one of 67 counties there. So you're not aware of any um, litigation uh, or policy actions aimed at restricting mail voting in Florida? No, no. I think that um, some of the litigation that, that we'll see, they're asking for um, the return postage. You know, I know that they're trying to characterize the, um, the uh, possibility that you would have to pay to return um, your ballot is a poll tax. Uh, you know, we all obviously wanted to, to take in recognition of COVID as well as just, you know, the increasing trend towards mail, ba uh, mail ballots to include that postage. Um, they are also, you know, there's also some, some thoughts of extending the deadlines for um, looking at and verifying those signatures. We have seen increased litigation the last um, election cycle that dealt with the signature verification process. And a lot of that has already been uh, modified in past elections to allow for the cures for no signatures, allow for the cures for a signature variation. I think what you'll see now in litigation is trying to extend the time frame for the canvassing board to look at those signatures and to also look at provisional ballots. So, you know, and that's a real balance because while you want to give voters every opportunity, you also need to get your election results tallied. Um, so that'll be an interesting um, issue as we move forward. I will say um, here locally, neither the supervisor of elections nor the canvassing board, in my opinion, has the authority to vary those time frames within which you would look at the mail ballots or the provisional ballots. I think the state of Florida is really the appropriate party uh, for any remedy that may be fashioned there. Of course, the courts could could order us to to do something, and we would obviously comply with that. Okay. When when is the supervisor coming um, to speak to us about her budget, Barry? Do you know? I I don't. It's pr probably Dell's looking it up right now. Um, okay. It's on the seventeenth. Seventeenth. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, I know Commissioner Justice had sent an email out about postage and Julie Marcus had sent a reply. Commissioner Justice, was that just on the return postage or was she looking at expanding it? See, there he is. I'll forward you uh, her response again, but it was simply talking about um, asking what her plans were as far as uh, other counties had mailed out a uh, what we would call a VBM request to every voter. And I was inquiring what her plans or thoughts were on that issue. But also, I'll, I don't know that she specifically had a response for that, uh, but certainly we can talk to her about it when she comes in. It's, it's in her budget request. And so, um, so is she, it's, I think it's, they'll correct me if I'm wrong, 125,000 additional that they requested. Um, and so we've been working with her on that. Yeah, okay. And um, we have a budget amendment related to the memo that she sent you uh, about a week or two ago um, for what you'd like to do this year that Joel was describing and now be coming forward at your board meeting on the 23rd. So you'll have uh, two bites of the apple, so to speak, to uh, discuss that with her. All right. Thank you. Very good. Thanks. Anything else for the county attorney? Yes, Commissioner Long. Uh, on top of all of the things we've already discussed, I just feel compelled to thank Jewel for the direction that she has taken the county attorney's office since she's been our real county attorney. I think that she has done an incredible job of putting some fresh air into 
the office up there and that her staff is really enjoying the environment. And I, I just couldn't be more pleased in the way in which she has served us and been so responsive to all of our needs. And so I'm very grateful that she's here and I hope she stays for quite a while. So thank you for all your hard work, Jewel. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate that. And on behalf of my staff, let me say thank you. Um, and again, I will preface this comment with an apology for what will be a bit longer memo that you all will be getting next week. Um, but I am going to take the opportunity to tell you all about some of the great things that that staff, uh, my staff, is doing out in the community because we really have put an emphasis um, on some of the community service and, and bar activities and things that I think really help with the professional development um, of all my staff, not just my attorneys, um, in their own professional careers. So I'll be, I'll be talking with you all a little bit about that in the memo that you all will be receiving. Good. Good thank you. Thank you. You're George. welcome. Okay. Next up, marketing and communications. Yes, uh, Donna Matiak here again. I'm the budget analyst for marketing and communications as well. Um, let me share the document. Uh, we also have uh, Shane here with us. Uh, he is the uh, strategic performance management um, analyst for marketing and Barbara Hernandez, uh, the director of marketing communications. Uh, we will, uh, can you see this document? Yes. Yes, perfect. So we will go ahead and start with the performance uh, summary and the COVID performance impact. Shane, can you take that? Morning again, commissioners. Uh, a couple of years ago, marketing and communications began developing performance indicators that uh, measure data, but the department has not set targets yet for these indicators. Um, marketing and communications is going to be working with myself uh, and, and working together to develop key performance indicators that will further illustrate the effectiveness, efficiency, and outcomes of the department. COVID-19 has uh, also greatly impacted the department in various ways. Staff focused almost fully transitioned to pandemic related to support uh, since March. As you can see in the attachments provided, social media messages, engagements, new followers and impressions, live chats and phone calls all escalated uh, quite significantly. For example, marketing communications saw an increase of almost 1600% uh, for new social media followers and a 272% increase in live chat messages for the month of March over the previous three month average. Uh, marketing communications also um, utilized Facebook Live for the first time, uh, along with some community partners. This year, they were able to conduct over 20 events to help communicate important messages to citizens regarding COVID-19 and uh, where and how to seek support through it. Um, Yana, I'll, I'll pass it off to you for the uh, budget update. Thank you, Shane. Um, moving forward with opportunities for efficiencies, uh, the department uh, took a vacant master control specialist position and reevaluated that position against the functional priorities within the department. As a result, uh, it was determined that the position would be deleted. Uh, partial funding uh, would be reallocated to support ADA compliance functions. That's $23,000. And um, additional funding, about $20,000, uh, to support the addition of a project coordinator project manager position. I want to make a note here that the project coordinator project manager position is not an UFTE. It was a vacant position that was upgraded to a project coordinator project manager position. And the difference between uh, the that upgrade dollar amount uh, partially came from the master control specialist position. Uh, the, uh, another opportunity for efficiency is to develop communications priorities in collaboration with other departments within the county. Uh, the department has already started working on it uh, last year and continues um, the work on this extensively this year. Uh, moving forward, the budget summary, uh, again with expenditures from um, FY17 to FY21 request is presented for your information um, and as well as the stuff in summary. I will refer to some of the information um, throughout the budget highlights discussion. The department does not have the decision packages for FY21. The total expenses for marketing and communication are decreasing by roughly $50,000. Personal services reflect a net decrease of about $3,200. Um, again, the master control specialist position was deleted. 
Um, there is also a $13,000 decrease in overtime pay for, 20, for FY21. The department has been uh, very efficient in adjusting uh, staffing and balancing the tasks within F available FTEs, and that um, provided us the availability to budget down the overtime line. The, uh, there is a $13,400 increase uh, in personal services due to the implementation of the exempt phase of the Evergreen study. Uh, the operating expenditures are reduced by $33,000 or 12.3% for FY21. And this is simply uh, the alignment of the expenditures with the historical spending. Uh, the department, again, has been uh, very efficient in looking at every single line uh, in their budget and um, taking the uh, budget down where they feel that they can realize some efficiencies and some savings. Uh, expenditures associated with the live chat are decreasing due to the features uh, being now supported by individual departments, um, as well as the department has increasingly transitioned from previously print-based outreach to currently digital outreach uh, via such online platforms as Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. Um, the, uh, this shift um, uh, speaks of the changes in how the audience uh, consumes uh, the information um, that it's going more and more uh, digital and it provides the department the ability to track return on investment uh, simply by obtaining frequent reports on product consumption and engagement. Capital outlay for the department is reduced by $13,800 or 32.3% over FY20 adopted budget. Um, the FY20 budget reflects uh, PC replacements for the public information officers. These replacements are not needed in FY21. Um, they are consistent. The, the replacement plan is consistent with the plan that Pro BTS provides um, for our PC replacement program. Uh, and uh, the expenditures vary year over year. Moving on to the COVID-19 impact, the department uh, will see the um, impact on their FY20 expenditures. Uh, they are increased by uh, $16,180 uh, to account for ASL interpreter costs, uh, for the imprinting costs to cover the cost of beach closing and opening signs, as well as to cover the uh, public service announcements were aired on TV. Um, as of right now, the FY21 budget request remained unchanged due to COVID. Um, Moving to the user fee changes, uh, there are no increases in user fees. Uh, certain user fees are proposed to be deleted due to either not having the market demand uh, at all in the past three, four years, or the technology being um, obsolete, such as uh, VHS tapes. Um, private sector market review was conducted in FY20 to look at um, the user fees. However, very limited feedback from the area companies was received. Um, this is all that I have. Barbara, do you have anything to add? Thank you, Yana. Um, just uh, real quickly, I wanted to uh, thank the board for the support, um, our leadership, um, but in particular, my, my team, they have done an amazing job, um, especially with the COVID-19 response. And um, just to give you a, a quick idea of, of the amount of work um, that has been accomplished over the past couple of months with the activation, um, our team created over 70 public service announcements, um, some in English, some in Spanish, um, most of them using the American Sign Language interpreters. We have conducted uh, roughly around 250 uh, media interviews. Um, new graphics, over 100 um, on social media. We reached over 8 million um, impressions. And our new COVID-19 website has been visited by over 600,000 people. Um, and that's just very high level. Um, I, I've been looking around, seeing what other communities are doing, and, and I just have to say I feel really proud of the work the team has accomplished, particularly in the COVID-19 response and the adaptability. Um, we've got staff working remotely, staff working on the field, um, and also staff at the EOC and in the offices, and, and it's just been seamless um, really getting the work done. So I really just want to um, express my appreciation for you know all of the great work. Yes, Commissioner Eger. You're muted, Commissioner. 
Okay, sorry. Uh, I'll get this down by the time we get off of virtual, I, I think. Um, Barbara, thank you for making those comments about your department because I certainly wanted to uh, extend my appreciation for all that you've, that you've been doing. Um, that all of the work that's been going on and, and, and the frustrations that we've dealt with with this COVID process and all that we're going and we make changes midstream and we're, you know, and your, your group has been so flexible and, 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 and of course, uh, changing the message to the new strategic direction that we're heading in. And I know it's been very, a lot of work for you guys. And I just really wanted to say thank you for that. I think really the flexibility and messaging is really important. Uh, we heard even on the emergency call this morning how we have to keep remembering that even though we don't have the safe, safe at home order in place, it's still safer to be at home and to keep reminding people to be careful when they get out there. And so you guys will ramp that up again. So uh, I, I just really wanted to say thank you for all that you all have done and um, uh, in, in dealing with some of the frustrations that we've had on the strategic side, you guys have responded great. So thank you. Yes, Commissioner Seal. I also um, wanted to extend my thanks to um, you, Barbara, and your entire staff. Um, you guys have done an amazing job during all of this COVID and really pushing the messages out. Um, your nightly report at the end of a long day um, has been great. So thank you so much. Yeah. Mr. Welch. Thank you. I want to echo that as well. And, and there's so many departments that we need to say that to. But in our BTS meeting, it was just so interesting how all this data is coming together in driving decision making, even to a degree that we didn't know about. For example, when we had the safer at home, they used GIS to give the sheriff's department a list of where the retail facilities were throughout the county. And we didn't even know all that was going on in the background, but like Commissioner Cecile said, the COVID-19 report nightly, Barbara, we all look for that <laughs> before we go to bed uh, to see what's happening. And just the amount of data that's being brought together from all the different departments and our partners and put in something that's very usable. And uh, even uh, there, the St. Pete Times did an editorial on our dashboards. I think we all saw that. So just doing a spectacular job and helping get information in a usable way, not only to our partners, but to the community. So I just wanted to echo that. Thank you. Ms. Rager. Yeah, I just, I forgot to mention, uh, Barbara, did you all do that, um, that hurricane document that came out, I guess it was last night or the night before? The hurricane guide? Yes. Yes. That was amazing. I, I don't know that, all the creativity that went into it. always it's very informative but there was a it seemed to be i don't know even better this year than before but the process that you go through in terms of your thought process uh, when a storm is approaching i thought was really creative and really good and again just kudos to uh to your staff so thank you thank you Michelle long Yes, uh, well, I'm not gonna repeat all of the accolades that we've already heard about you this morning, Barbara, and your staff, because I too am really look forward to seeing your input because I use your messaging in my own communication uh, via the, the folks that I communicate with on a weekly basis. I was particularly, um, it almost saddened by the by hearing this morning that the issue of how we're dealing with the healthcare crisis and not only our community but throughout the country has turned so political. And I'm wondering if you've thought about and or developed any messaging to address that in a way that can be replicated by all of the rest of us so we're all on the same page. Because goodness knows the virus doesn't care what politics you are embracing. It's more about life and health and protecting so the, our families. 
Yeah, there's there's several things that we're doing. Um, one of them is we're continuing to coordinate with the regional public information network um, for Pinellas County and just getting best practices, talking about what's our strategy, what's our messaging moving forward, especially now that we're in this point where um, we're hearing a lot more um, voices saying, well, you shouldn't, you should. Um, it was very clear um, when the Safer at Home order came out, you know, these are the things that I should be doing. But, you know, as you mentioned, it's it's become more uh, divided in terms of uh, public perception and what people feel they should be doing or not. So we're going to be bringing that back together um, at our next messaging uh, editorial meeting where we plan um, our strategies, and we'll be happy to share that with all of you. I look forward to it very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And thank you very much, Barbara, for everything you guys are doing. Got a professional team in there. Uh, anything else for marketing communications? Okay. Uh, next up then, county administration. Oh, let's give this one a hard time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, God, tough crowd. Well, good morning again. Uh, as you know, I'm Bill Berger with the Office of Management and Budget. I'm the budget analyst for county administration. Um, obviously, Barry is with us, and we also have Rodney Marion from Workforce Relations joining us. And to start it off, we're going to have Aubrey Phillips present on the uh, work plan and performance measures. And I'm going to share my screen here for you, and we'll walk through that together. Good morning again, commissioners. I'm going to give you a quick update on performance for county administration. Uh, following an initial survey of managers, the planned end dates and the relevant budget impacts have been adjusted out for the initiatives to reevaluate the employee performance appraisal system and to develop a succession planning program. And this was a strategic decision to allow for sufficient engagement and training that's really needed to support the long term success of both of these initiatives. Following uh, monitoring of the pay and class uh, study implementation, uh, new initiatives are being developed now to create career ladders and make adjustments for equity that were not addressed in the pay and class study. As those initiatives are being defined, they'll be added to the work plan for county administration so you continue to get updates on them regularly. Uh, prior to 2009, or last year, uh, the performance measures for county administration were based heavily on uh, previous initiatives uh, related to increasing participation in internship, internships, community service mentoring, and tuition reimbursement programs. Uh, Human Resources is continuing to monitor these metrics and we keep an eye on them as well. Uh, but as county administration as, is focusing on some strategic areas for workforce relations, we're re realigning the performance measures to adjust uh, that and make sure that we've got uh, the right data in there to tell the right story. Um, as part of that, in FY20 last year, we added two new measures related to employee satisfaction with one uh, executive leadership and with compensation and performance. And the reason we added those in is those are what we expect to see be positively impacted by the ongoing workforce relations initiatives and the other efforts that uh, Barry and the rest of county administration have taken to improve communication and engagement with our workforce. Um, additional measures related to uh, succession planning and performance um, are, will be identified as the workforce relation program really develops. And then uh, lastly, as you're aware, we are uh, refining and reevaluating the methodology and survey instruments for the citizen values survey, making sure that we have good representative, representative data uh, about our citizens' preferences and priorities. Um, we'll update outcome measures related to citizen satisfaction as part of that uh, process of reevaluating the survey. And with that, I'll hand it off to Bill, who will talk about well, some of the budget. Impact. Wait, yep. can I ask? Can I ask? Hold on. Go ahead. Can, can I ask a question about some of what you just said? Certainly. Um, in one of our presentations, and now because I've got them scattered all over the place, I'm not sure which one it was, we talked about the citizen survey dipping below 85% for the first time in quite a that, while. That was in OMB's uh, presentation okay. earlier this morning, and yeah. uh, that was not the citizen satisfaction or the citizen survey. Um, oh. 
that is the ongoing voice of the customer survey. Um, so we have ongoing uh, surveys that we ask the people who uh, contact us to request services. We ask them for feedback about those, their service interaction. The citizen values survey is much more focused on big picture um, priorities and perspectives of our citizens. So when you talk about the methodology and the survey instruments and that you're taking all of that out, what, what measurements are you now going to focus on that are different than what they were before? So we're, we're reevaluating the citizen values survey. And as part of that, we will identify what the um, correct metrics will be for uh, incorporating these data back in. We didn't just leave in the prior citizen values survey data um, because we know that we need to make sure that there's continuity and we're not um, having trend breaks in the data. Um, so we'll, we'll make sure that the commission is part of that conversation as we move forward, but we know that it's important that you have reliable data about our citizens' preferences and priorities that's representative of, of our entire community. Well, I especially like the fact that you just said that the commission would be involved in some of that because some of us may have specific um, training and or knowledge about how you measure outcomes and standards and objectives and all of that type of thing and service. And I, I think it's important that we have a voice and a, you know, at least know what, what you're thinking as you move forward. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. All right, well, moving on. Um, Aubrey did mention a couple of these, but as far as opportunities for efficiencies, really they're opportunities for us to better address the priorities that we uh, have with our workforce relations program. And there are several initiatives that we're gonna be uh, taking a look at that Rodney will be able to speak to after I'm done presenting the budget information along with Barry. And one of them is a performance evaluation system. Another one is succession planning and doing some work related to that. Uh, doing a market survey for some specific classifications. Um, applicant tracking and onboarding software, which would be an improvement in the way that we're able to bring applicants into our recruitment process and then bring them on board into county employment. And then paying classification study follow-ups because while the paying classification, paying classification study did address some issues, it didn't actually fulfill all of the needs that were identified in that study. So we have follow-up items that we're going to be pursuing as well. Um, as far as COVID-19 impacts, while there are significant impacts on the staff in terms of the number of hours they were working, uh, there aren't any budgetary impacts related to that because they're exempt staff. So just work however many hours they have to work and they get paid the same amount. So you're getting a better bargain for your dollar this year. Um, as far as the budget summary and highlights, um, excluding the workforce relations initiatives, uh, the total request for FY21 is a 3.9% increase relative to this year's adopted budget. Personal services is only up 1.1%. Uh, there is a decision package that was added for this year in FY21. Um, it was supposed to be added in FY20, but frankly, I made a mistake and forgot to include it. Um, so we're including that appropriation for next year. That's for the consultant-led countywide sustainability and resiliency action plan. And I do want to assure you that the planning for that and the RFP for that is not being delayed by my mistake in putting appropriation forward. So that timeline has not changed. And the RFP is out right now, and they're hoping to be able to bring a consultant on board before the end of the year. Um, excluding the decision packages and the workforce relations initiatives, Operating expenses reflect a decrease of about $38,000. And that's based on a couple of uh, staffing changes that have recruitment expenses involved that are not anticipated for next year. Uh, and then finally, capital outlay is reflecting a decrease and that's based on the cyclical schedule for PC replacements. Um, as far as COVID-19 impacts the budget, in terms of what's being requested and what was estimated for this year, there aren't any changes for next year's budget, but as far as how much we expect to spend this year, there is a reduction in travel and training because of camp conferences being canceled or going online with the different costs associated with them. And then finally, uh, there's a staffing summary here. And really what I wanna draw your attention to here is the fact that while it shows a significant increase between FY18 at 10 and a half positions 
and FY21 at 20 positions, almost every one of those positions was actually a realignment. So while there is some growth, uh, almost all of that growth is realigning positions to better reflect where they are organizationally reporting within the county structure. So there are departments that, I'll use the three uh, assistant to the county administrator positions as an example. Uh, those are all the same positions that existed before, but those three individuals are actually performing double duty in those positions and they're reporting to Barry and, in county administration to make sure that there's better accountability for the work being done by those positions in support of the unincorporated areas. So that reflects an increase, but that's really not an increase in cost. And with that, I'll turn it over to Barry and uh, Barry will uh, partner with Rodney in addressing uh, some more operational impact. So that, that's actually a good chart, Bill. Um, as you've seen, we've addressed a number of areas where kind of a, a re reprioritization of where we're putting uh, time and attention, um, but we tried to do that within the existing work, workforce. The one uh, increase to that was an ICMA fellow. ICMA is International City and County Managers Association. So the same way we're recruiting for um, entry-level people and we're working with the schools to have internships and create career paths, uh, we want to do that at a professional level too. ICMA has a um, fellowship program uh, that is well refined. It's competitive nationwide for uh, kids coming out of their master's program and then come on board. You know, and we created a fellowship that would allow us to um, them to start with us, rotate through different departments, get exposure, and they get experience. But we also use that youth to have you know a fresh set of eyes. It also then you know creates a pathway if they're good uh, and we have positions to be able to fill vacancies in the future. So that was the only real addition. The other ones were um, were realignments, um, uh, you know, as we saw with the sustainability coordinator and workforce relations. On the sustainability coordinator, they, you know, Hank gave you kind of an update of his efforts of uh, thus far working with the departments and trying to coordinate um, the various activities around sustainability. We're working on the sustainability plan. That'll be um, provided to you later this summer. That's part of the consultant work because as they get into specific technical areas, obviously he's the, he's the quarterback, he's championing this, um, but they'll need to draw on specific expertise in certain technical areas. Uh, and that's how we partner with, or with a firm that provides that as we need that to, su to supplement uh, our internal expertise. Uh, so that's the reason, and that's the way in which then he'll use that, those resources, using all of the different departments to create the sustainability direction. And again, uh, that'll be coming to you probably July or August of this year. Um, a lot of our efforts, Commissioner okay. Long? Yeah, well, I, 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 I know that COVID has really put a dent in a lot of the plans that we, we had but I'm very concerned about this plan that we've been working on, it seems like for a while now, because I, I could be very wrong, but I think that given the active hurricane season that we all have to look forward to, that we're now preparing for, it could have a dire effect on our resil resiliency and sustainability activities, number one. And number two, I think that because of the way our work has changed and our life is changing and our traveling back and forth is changing as a result of this pandemic, there's a lot of um, momentum that we can take advantage of given how the planet has just started cleaning up itself. I will so, assure you there's there's been no slowdown um, in our um, sustainability and resiliency efforts. Um, you know, and, and I go back to what the initial report was, was not to show you the work of Hank, but to consolidate the work of departments throughout the county that have been actively looking at sustainability and, sustainability and resiliency issue for years. It's incorporated within our codes, it's incorporated within their work. I just couldn't point to one place to show you all of those collective efforts. Um, and so the whole idea about the resiliency plan is to capitalize on all the work we've done and then set a clear direction about where we can enhance that in the future. Um, and so that's, I think, we'll, that will better shed light on all of the good work, but also identify a, a clear pathway 
onto um, additional initiatives uh, that we can we can continue to improve on those efforts. So so will will that um, consultant when they finally come up with the plan will it have a timeline for the action plan? Absolutely. Okay. They're well, already working. Well, they're already working on these things. So they're you know they're not stopping. They're not. We're not waiting for a consultant to tell us what to do. We want to use the consultant to um, to provide technical expertise. If I if I get into let's just say solar, you know, well, you know, there's there's very technical issues there that you would you would utilize your staff, but then you would utilize a consultant for that tech, technical expertise in that particular area. It's not that we're not working on those things. It's uh, adding um, an enhanced level of review and to give us the ideas of how to refine. Uh, the direction that we're going to go in that particular area. Um, that's and the reason then, we're having the firm on board. Well, we also incorporate all of the things that we've learned from having going through this COVID um, virus threat so <laughs> that we are prepared going forward when it comes back in the fall, potentially. Yes. And, and we're going to, you know, at the end of um, June here, we're starting to work on a kind of lessons learned. So we're going to um, we're going to do an after action review of all of our COVID efforts. Um, but as you've heard on the calls too, um, you know, we're not taking our foot off the gas. We're preparing uh, for a second wave. We're preparing, uh, prepare for the worst, hope for the best, you know, and, and so we're going to, but we're also going to do a lessons learned. Um, and I'm, and I'm going to be talking to you about that because I think there's lessons learned, you know, at an executive level, the way we communicate, we kind of, you know, um, changed on the fly. Um, and we, you know, we were used to our hurricane and now you got something that is going to last a year. Well, kind of changes everything and the way you coordinate, communicate. So I think there's a lot of things that we can have a very robust discussion about, of how to improve for the future. And in light of, this is my last point, in light of current events that are going on, hopefully they will certainly add all of that into the plan and ensure that we're looking after and taking care of our most vulnerable population, the long-term <laughs> care facilities, our most vulnerable populations, the small children, the, you know, people that are having problems finding food and paying rent and all of that kind of stuff. That's really, really critical. Absolutely. Thank you. So that's around our sustainability. The other piece that, and as you know, I've briefed each of you individually, we spent a lot of time this year really working on workforce relations. Um, and I couldn't be more happy that Rodney joined me uh, in trying to really look at our workforce um, efforts. We had some pretty significant issues. As you know, the um, Evergreen study was supposed to be the, be the all and end all of, of all of our uh, <laughs> workforce issues. And, you know, it simply wasn't. One, it wasn't done well, um, just to be very blunt. Um, but two, it you know created a lot of gaps. But it was also supposed to be a phased in approach. I will tell you this: there is no perfect pay plan, um, and there is no perfect implementation. <laughs> I mean, I've been through a number of them, you know, and and there's always challenges. This one had more challenges than normal, but we're working through those. And we really, I needed someone that could that I trusted that could really help us with this. Um, uh, Rodney and I conducted over twenty. Um, employee forums with both employees separate from managers um, and we really tried to listen to our employees and the number one issue obviously was the um, evergreen study he's rolling out right now um, career paths um, pay issues and and making sure that we're properly compensating our employees and more importantly creating a career path for them you know as they gain skills uh, they get compensated for that um, you know, we had two um, union efforts. I don't really have, a, I mean, if somebody wants to unionize, I don't have a problem with it. I had 11 unions where I was at before, but I have a real problem with people feeling that they have to do that only to be heard, right? And to have their issues addressed. That's a failure in, in, in leadership and a failure in management. So we're working hard to address that. Um, and and so we, we listened to our employees. We spent a lot of time on that. He's rolling out these revised pay plans. We're going to have to work with the personnel board on some of those um, to get consistency in the way we deal with um, reclasses, the way we deal with career ladders, um, and and where we where we create these training opportunities to take people out of high school into 
career fields and create internships and, and other means. Um, there's a lot of work to do that with several thousand employees. Um, we're, it's, gonna, it's a work in progress, but we, we're making great strides in it. Um, and again, I'm, I'm, I just couldn't be more happy. I, we just got to get it done, you know, and that's a uh, department by department. Um, you know, position by position effort. And I, Rodney's on the line, and I, I'd like for him to just kind of tell you, you know, his thoughts in terms of where we're at, where we're going, and timelines for uh, being able to complete all this. Uh, forgive me for you not being able to see me. I'm going to, it's probably the operator, but I'm going to blame technology for right now, but my camera's not working. Uh, one of the things we really wanted to take a look at is the performance evaluation system. A lot, a lot of, just about everything kind of hinges on that. Uh, we want to make sure, and in our conversations, Barry and I, with employees as well as the supervisors, we realize that there are different expectations with the performance evaluation. We need to align that, make sure everybody's on the same page, make sure everyone understands what we want to accomplish with a good performance evaluation system, and then create one that's got enough flexibility in it that it takes care of all the different jobs. You don't evaluate a craft worker the same way you're evaluated an administrative worker. And as Commissioner Long indicated, the workplace and things are changing. And as the workplace changes, so your methods of evaluating employees have to change too. So we need a system that's robust and flexible and that meets the needs of both the departments, the evaluators, as well as the employees. Uh, there's some other issues with regard to applicant tracking that we're taking care of, but the employees really felt um, um, that it was important for us to really help with regard to career paths and career development. And we're putting in place uh, programs or proposing programs that will satisfy those needs and give them some satisfaction as well as some training um, opportunities. I will admit in the 40 years that I've been doing this, um, here in Pinellas County, you've got some of the most ambitious uh, employees who really want to advance themselves. We just need to give them the opportunities to do that, be able to identify those individuals who are ready to move and then move on. And uh, just to piggyback on what Rodney was saying there, you know, when we did our, our forums, we had employees that said, you know, we get evaluated every six months, we set goals and objectives. And we had employees say that they've been there five years and have never been evaluated um, and, and, and everywhere in between. And so when we're talking about all these different things about career paths, when we're talking about um, um, pay for performance and all these things. Well, if you don't have a pay system that's consistent or a pay evaluation system that's consistent, it makes it almost impossible to do all these other things. So it, it quickly rose to something that needed to be addressed. And that's what Rod has been working, one of the areas that Rod's been working on. Anything else, Rod? Nope, I think that's it. Okay. And, you know, we, we found a lot of good things. You heard about that at 911. I walked into an employee forum. We did, walked into an employee forum and they told us exactly what their concerns were. <laughs> um, you know what? But we listened. And guess what? You know, I walk around there now and the employees know me. Um, and they say that all the things that they said that they had concerns about are being addressed. We're going to address the turnover rate there. You cannot run a 911 center when you have over a 20% turnover rate, um, period. It takes a year to train people. And so that's something we had to nip in the bud quickly, and we did. Um, and, and so we're, we're, but it's a work in progress, and we're going to continue. That's one of the areas where we have to look at pay. But it wasn't just the pay. It was, it was burnout. Um, because of that con continual lack of that, it was the way we did shifts, the way we managed shifts, and the way first-line supervisors were not managing. Um, so there was a number of issues there, but that's part of these employees' forms, so we get to hear directly, and then we can act accordingly. Um, but that's uh, that's a big part. The other the other part that I wanted to just touch on is um, we're doing a lot of department reviews, and you'll see you'll see that in some of the consulting dollars. Um, but I really think, you know, every, almost every department really should be reviewed about every five years. And you, you know, five or six years, you, you get a second set of eyes on that. You get the review. Right now, we're looking at our facilities, uh, the way we um, conduct our facility operations. We're looking at fleet management and those practices. And we're looking at our purchasing. You know, I'm tired of seeing, you know, it takes six months to get through our process. Um, we've, we've, got, we, we've got to streamline that and make that more efficient. 
And so we've got all three of those reviews um, being uh, conducted as we speak. And that's my summary comments. Okay. Should we move into uh, human resources then? We can do that. Who's got human resources? Jim, your microphone is off. Uh, good morning again, uh, Jim Abernathy um, with Office of Management and Budget, and I'm the, uh, the budget analyst for human resources uh, and the employee benefits uh, fund. Uh, with us today is also um, Mel Franey, the interim director of uh, the human resources department, and um, she will be uh, speaking at the, uh, at the end of the budget presentation. So let me share the document. Okay. So um, for uh, for the HR department overall, uh, the the continue or potential threat is the continued impact from COVID nineteen, uh, which may drive health care claims. Um, over what we have in the estimates or uh, potentially in the budget. Uh, that uh, so far we've had a, uh, from, a uh, from a health plan perspective, the impact has been minimal, but um, you know, the, the long-term effects uh, will still be, uh, we'll still be dealing with those down the line. Um, Human resources is funded uh, through the general fund and is also responsible for managing the county's the county employees' uh, retirement and benefits through the Employee Health Benefits Fund, which is an uh, internal service fund. Uh, the uh, those funds are uh, derived mainly from contributions made by the employees, departments, uh, department budgets, and retirees. Uh, it, the county's benefit program is self-funded and uh, it is required to maintain reserves and compliance of the state of Florida uh, regulations on self-insured plans, um, which is part of their annual budget. Uh, uh, the employee health benefits plan also maintains reserves. Uh, uh, part of their reserves is to contain, uh, contains funds uh, contributed towards the county's other post-employment benefits uh, actuarial liability. So the, uh, the total reserves that, that you will see later uh, includes contributions that have been made over the years for uh, the OPEB liability. Uh, on the general fund side, uh, their FY21 request is $4.4 million, uh, which is a decrease of $22,000 uh, from uh, FY20. Uh, the personal services has a decrease of about uh, twenty thousand uh, dollars. They were able to uh, decrease their FTE by one point one uh, positions. Uh, I eliminated a vacant position uh, that was not needed. Uh, the, on the operating side, the uh, expenses are decreasing by thirty seven thousand dollars. This is um, mainly due to uh, uh, in FY20, there are uh, computers and, and small tech uh, items that uh, were purchased and uh, will not need to be purchased in FY21. On the capital outlay side, there was an increase of $35,000. Um, and that is also for uh, computer replacements per the BTS PC replacement schedule. Uh, and while well, uh, the difference between the Operating decrease in the capital increase is the value or the, um, the, the cost of the individual PCs that are replaced. So um, the capital uh, covers items that are uh, $1,000 or more. So these are just different computers that are being replaced for HR. Uh, for the Employee Health Benefits Fund, um, I'll go up here. Uh, the FY21 request, uh, including reserves, is $170.6 million. 
uh, compared to uh, $149.8 million in FY20. Uh, the, uh, the personal services, which includes two FTE in that fund, uh, is increasing by $7,000 or 3.5%. Uh, their FTE remains at two, uh, no change in that. Uh, the benefits claim, which is the bulk of the budget, uh, is increasing by 2.4% to $73.1 million. And what is included in there is the, uh, the, the claims for medical, dental, vision, uh, mental health, and retiree cost for Medicare Advantage. Uh, operating expenses, uh, which includes administrative fees uh, to run our self-funded uh, health program, uh, is increasing by $113,000 to $4.4 million. Uh, almost 80% of that total is the administrative fee that we pay to United Healthcare. Um, the total reserves in the health benefit fund uh, is increasing by $19 million or 25, almost 26% to $92.8 million. Of that total, $45 million is, uh, is what I described earlier as contributions for the OPEB actuary liability um, within that fund. Uh, and of that total, of the 45 million, 26 million has been contributed uh, by the general fund. Uh, on the revenue side, uh, the revenues are um, decreasing slightly by $165,000 to $78.1 million. And uh, this decrease is uh, mainly due to the way we budget at 95% uh, of uh, projected uh, revenue for some of these uh, items in here. Uh, we still uh, anticipate a $2 million transfer from the general fund uh, for the OPEB liability. Uh, um, on the revenue side as well, um, it is funded mainly, as I said earlier, by contributions from uh, for health benefits. And in FY21, uh, because of the, uh, the savings that they have seen in previous years, um, we were able, it, OMB and HR were able to keep the per employee benefits, uh, health benefit cost at $21,660 per year. And that is the, the charge that is uh, paid by each department uh, to the health fund uh, for a filled full-time employee or, or an employee that receives benefits. Uh, and, excuse me, uh, that is the budget highlights for uh, for both HR and for the Employee Benefits Fund. Um, Mo, if you would like to address uh, address everyone. I would. Okay. Um, can we take the share thing down? Yep, I will stop the share. Awesome. Hi, everybody. Hello. Um, Welcome so, back. <laughs> thank you. It's good Hi, Dan. It was like deja vu a little bit, except virtual. I bet. Yeah, anyway. Uh, glad to be here. Obviously, Mo Franey, Interim Director of Human Resources, and it is good to see you all. Um, I, um, I did want to highlight a few things, if I may. I know I'm, uh, I guess Paul and I are the only thing between you guys and lunch, so uh, I'll make it quick. But um, so first of all, I, I think many of you probably know HR does do uh, regular various key performance indicators, and they measure those on a regular basis internally and externally. Uh, but I just wanted to kind of highlight a few specific issues for you today, because uh, I think they may have more pertinence to you. Um, we have begun a new uh, employee assistance contract based on feedback that we needed improvements in place with United Healthcare and Optum. And so we've got some additional reporting measures too. So we make sure that um, we've got some good vendor outcome measurement tools uh, for us. Uh, the second thing, I think you're familiar with the standard who basically administers our FMLA program, as well as a couple other things. And uh, there's been some issues with that. We've, we went through an RFP process with that. We were ready to actually uh, uh, basically award that to a different group. Uh, it was advised by county attorney and 
uh, staff uh, among discussions that it was probably better uh, to wait until we were through COVID to make that kind of a change. The, but we will be doing that by the end of the year. So probably just the uh, first of the year, we'll have that in place. Mm -hmm. Third, and I've actually seen a few of those issues pop up quite frankly on that, uh, that particular concern since I've been here. Uh, the third thing was we're building scopes for dental and vision uh, uh, healthcare uh, for RF RFPs, excuse me. And um, we had some issues of concern that uh, in some of the satisfaction surveys that those were kind of areas where we had some issues. So those are intended to go out to bid next year so we can try to address all those. And we've built in some of that feedback concern from employees. We have removed uh, the famous phone tree in benefits at the beginning of 2020. And uh, it's probably one of the number one things I heard about since I've been here, the famous phone tree that no one liked and it was hard to get through to benefits and have the personal touch. Uh, our new benefits person, Kelly Faircloth, she came in December. And I think right away recognized that that wasn't really a great user-friendly way to do it. So uh, that is gone. The, uh, the other thing I'd add and, and actually working with appointing authorities and uh, in particular Barry as well about just wanting to get some good benchmarking of our local competitors in the area of benefits. So we're working on that with Willis Towers and also Sarasota County I think does one of the better uh, holistic reviews of some of the immediate competitors. So we'll be able to give you some information on that. And I know that's been particularly important to the county administrator and some of the other appointing authorities. Uh, we do have the Benefits Advisory Committee, which I think you all are familiar with. Uh, that group has met three times. And of course that's for specifically to get employee input on our benefit structure and what's more important in the benefits area from our employees perspective. Uh, in those three meetings, mostly it's been education up to this point. They've been educated on United Healthcare. Uh, Willis Towers gave them an overview. Uh, so it's a lot to take in. I've talked to a couple of the members of that group and, uh, you know, they're learning a lot and, uh, but it's appreciated. And I think we'll be able to get some good advice and, uh, and thoughts from the employee group because of that. The other thing that I just wanted to mention, just specific to COVID, I thought that might be interested to you all in our, um, Employee base, we've actually had eight employee COVID cases among our employees. Um, we, um, that's that stayed pretty steady for, for quite a few weeks now. The, um, as you know, United Healthcare uh, put out, uh, and of course the appointing authorities agreed with that to allow for 100% coverage for testing, for treatment, and for virtual visits when it came to COVID. That has just been extended to July 24th. And again, it's, we've checked with budget. It's a, it's a minimal amount of uh, budget dollars. So that's, uh, that's gonna happen. Um, we have also had some requests from employees for emergency loans out of 457 accounts that required the appointing authorities to all opt in to the ability to do that. Um, and we, I think we've had eight or nine employees that wanted to do that, but they're fairly desperate to try to get to that without having high penalties. So we've been able to do that as well. Um, HR has been working remotely. Uh, we have about six employees back in the office. So we're looking at how we're gonna do this and obviously trying to be very cautious. But if, from the remote perspective, a lot of our jobs are actually pretty conducive remotely. So we've been able to really keep things going, um, I think pretty comprehensively. I, I'll give you one example that I think is kind of impressive, which is from January to mid-March when we left the office, we had 90 new hires onboarded. And from mid-March to May 31st, when we've been remote, we've had 100 new employees onboarded. So pretty seamless in terms of helping to make this happen. And I think in a lot of our other areas, the same is true. Um, I was going to add that I've never actually started a job where I had to meet all my employees virtually. Pretty, uh, pretty interesting to meet 35 employees online. Uh, your Microsoft Teams is awesome. I've already told the Dunning City Manager, like, you need to look into that. It's really good. And uh, so it's, it's been working very well, though. Um, and finally, I did want to just, I guess, from the personal perspective of me being here, it is actually my end of my fourth week. Feels like I've been here a year. <clears throat> but 
Um, I've had Zoom meetings with all of the personnel board members. Um, I've had in, I'm just completing individual meetings with all of our HR staff, which is about 35 of them, which I, I want to tell you, you have, you have some great staff over there uh, with some amazing backgrounds, uh, just impressive backgrounds. Um, and I did want to mention one person in particular, because I know it's been kind of a vulnerable spot that's had some ups and downs, and that is the benefits area. We have Kelly Faircloth, who started in December, and um, just in my one month, um, I, I've been very impressed with Kelly. I think she brings a lot of good stuff to the table. Um, I have uh, met with the, uh, or virtually met with the EAC chair, Lisa, and I have other meetings. Uh, appointing authorities, I'll probably have finished my meetings with by the end of next week. Uh, talk to some of your directors. I had a great meeting with Rodney Marion yesterday and uh, was impressed with some of the stuff he's doing. We talked about how to kind of merge things together and, and make that work in a good way. And um, so that's it, unless you have questions for me. But um, I, uh, I want to obviously thank the HR employees for welcoming me in and uh, helping bring me up to speed and, uh, and a good team. Commissioner, if I can just start off, uh, you know, uh, because Mo, you know, agreed to take this interim, you know, assignment. I think she was, she was happy where she was at, but, you know, we had some real challenges to improve communication. And I think that's, the, you know, one of her clear tasks that, that she can do. And we had some uh, communication issues, obviously, between the appointing authorities and the personnel board. Um, and then COVID hit and it even made it harder to communicate, <laughs> you know, and, and had to delay a personnel board meeting. You know, so there's been a, a number of bumps and bruises you know, along the way, but we're going to get there because, you know, and the personnel board's all committed to a meeting with the appointing authorities and working together and talking through issues. That'll be one of the things we schedule, you know, here in the future as we can have in-person meetings to where we're all sitting around a table and we're talking. It'll be a public meeting. Um, but, you know, I think we, we have, we, we almost have unison in, in terms of agreement on things we need to work on. Sometimes it's just communication issues that, that occur that make it sound bigger than it is. And, and we, we really are on the same team and we can work through those. Mo's going to be uh, help facilitate that. Um, I'm going to be meeting with the appointing authorities coming up here on the 15th to talk about uh, the, uh, the consultants going to be presenting their like top candidates for that. So we're moving on the permanent um, assignment. Uh, so that'll, that'll be also occurring uh, fairly soon. All right. Any questions for Mo? Good to see you. Welcome back. Thank you. <laughs> yes, Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and uh, most probably not at the top of your data pile list to be aware of, but um, I'm always curious because this is something that employees always talk to me about is how many of our employees uh, don't actually do the annual uh, biometrics test where they save the $500 mm -hmm. the next year? I've always been curious about if we could get numbers or a ballpark of what our percentage of people who actually complete it um, or don't, but then also kind of like how many, what's the percentage of our employees that that's the only thing they do is they do the biometrics, they turn it in, and then they don't have any other relationship with all the other great uh, services that are available through HR. So if we could kind of get a ballpark idea of some of those numbers at, at your earliest convenience, but it's obviously not, uh, I know it's not on the top of your pile today. No, but absolutely. That's always good to see because, it, again, that investment in our wellness program is important to our claims in the end. Thank you. All right. Anything else for Mo? All right. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Um, if I you. can go back to one, um, Commissioner Justice um, asked about, um, he, he looked at the table of organization under the county administrator and he said, all right, who's Dave Hare? Um, <laughs> so... <laughs> I just figured I should address that with everyone. As part of the COVID, I, I'm sure I've talked to some of you about this um, and then uh, not others, um, trying to keep track on some of our communication. So what, what I mentioned that I had a, um, that I had great concerns when I met with our 911 employees. Um, when I heard the, um, the issues there, there was, a, there was a gentleman, his name's Dave Hare, not Craig Hare, out, out working under Jim. Um, that he uh, he actually was where I was at before. He was the basically the number two person in the sheriff's office. He was a former chief of police, and he oversaw 911 centers. Um, and, but he also um, did he works as a consultant for um, Northwestern University 
doing studies and staffing studies of police, EMS, 911 centers across the nation. Um, he moved to Palm Harbor, I don't know, six months ago or whatever, and I needed someone quick. I hired him and a Canaan's old position and asked him to do a review of the 911 area. So he's been out there helping Jim implement um, the things that I, you know, I think from, um, from that standpoint, um, Jim had a lot of these, but we had a lot of turnover at 911 in terms of the top two positions. And, and really, Dave just gave them a hand. Um, so it's not a permanent position. Uh, we're charging it off to them. It actually, it was in Canaan's position. I wanted it in my office because I wanted to have visibility in terms of what was going on out there. But they're doing great. They're implementing all the changes. Um, however, what we did, though, as part of that, we identified that there's really no depth um, out in uh, safety and emergency services. So we took an existing position and created a deputy director position. That position has been posted. Uh, it'll be competitively selected. They will be one of those competing for that. But um, that is posted. It's a public and it's going to be uh, uh, reviewed by the committee that Jim works with, which is all the fire and EMS um, personnel. There you go. All right. Okay. Let's look at uh, Office of Human Rights. Good afternoon. I am Lori Sullivan, uh, the budget analyst that supports the Office of Human Rights. Also joining today are Paul Valenti, the OHR director, and Jeffrey Lohr, the compliance manager. As you all know, um, OHR provides our residents in Pinellas County with protection against wage theft and discrimination in fair housing, employment, and places of public accommodation. They do this with some financial assistance from Housing and Urban Development, as well as the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Before we get into the fiscal year 21 budget request, Paul is going to go over his department performance measures with you. These measures are set for him by the independent board that governs OHR. And I will share my screen, Paul, so you can go ahead and get started. Appreciate that. And good morning, or is it good afternoon, commissioners? I lost a track of time here. I good guess afternoon. we're in the afternoon hours now. Good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, my name, for the record, is Paul Valenti. I have the privilege of serving as your human rights director. By way of our performance measures, as Lori indicated, um, these are set or at least adopted by the Human Rights Board, for which I have the honor of uh, serving as their employee and their hire. Um, one of the measures that we consistently look to meet is ob obtaining a certain percentage of housing cases closed within 100 days. That's in turn because it's a statutory requirement under the fair housing laws at the federal level, and it's a performance measure that HUD assesses when they look at our office's performance. HUD requires at least 50% of cases be closed within 100 days. Um, we've, over the last several years, been at close to at or over 80%. Um, the target for this year um, is 60%, and we'll get into the why that dropped a little bit when we talk about some of the other performance measures. But um, we're confident that we're going to come actually in above that 60% and probably closer to the 80% mark that we've historically attained for the last three, four years. As well, um, it looks like the number of employment cases that we close in the fiscal year is going to be more than in last year. We set a target of 120. We don't think we'll get to that target. But if you'll know, over the last several years, we've actually closed lower numbers, but incrementally moving up. We believe we'll be closer to about 112 at the end of the day, um, instead of the 120 that we had hoped for. And um, that leads to why some of these measures or uh, metrics have dropped in the expectation a little bit. If you look at the percentage of internal investigations closed within four weeks, as you know, we also serve as the internal compliance for EEO laws for the county and most of its appointing authorities, um, actually all the appointing authorities. And, and we've seen a slight uptick in number of internal cases across appointing authorities. We have the same amount of resources. And so what that means is when an investigator is investigating or working on an internal matter, that's one external housing or employment matter that they're not working on. Uh, and that's why you, you'll see that we kind of recalibrated what our expectations were by way of the other performance measures. Um, we still mediate almost half of the wage theft complaints that this office also administers. 
and um, by way of uh, COVID impacts upon our office, our intake officer has related to us. There's actually been several. Our intake officer has related to us that numerous inquiries that we've received over the last three months, we've issued drafted complaints, set them out and followed up, but they're not coming back in the same um, rates or ratios as historically they have. Now we suspect that's because in these trying times, people have other priorities than maybe getting some paperwork back to us. We'll continue to follow up. We're amenable to e-signatures, but when we hear nothing back, it makes it hard to claim it's a perfected complaint. Um, so that's where we are by way of our performance measures with the Office of Human Rights. And, and I'd be glad to turn it back to Ms. Sullivan for some of the financial aspects of our budget. Thank you, Paul. Um, as far as um, opportunities for efficiencies with OHR, uh, next year's budget request includes $10,000 for one or more of the staff to become a State of Florida certified mediator. Once this has been achieved, we will be able to handle more mediation in-house, which will also reduce our need for outside contractors. There's also an opportunity to reduce the footprint once the countywide facility study is completed, allowing for less overhead costs than we currently incur. The biggest threat facing OHR would be if there are federal funding cuts made to our partners at HUD and EEOC. If that happens, we may see reduced funding for case processing, as well as training and other administrative costs. Moving on to the budget summary. As discussed earlier, the Office of Human Rights receives revenues from both the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission and the Housing and Urban Development. The amount of these revenues tend to range anywhere from $300,000 to over $350,000 annually. Any expenses not covered by these revenues are paid out of the general fund. The expenditure request of almost $1.3 million is driven mainly by personal services, which reflects over 87% of their total budget. There is an increase of 5.8% for fiscal year 21, and that covers their staff of 10. This staffing level has remained steady for over 10 years, even after adding the wage theft program in 2016. Part of the personal services increase is due to a leave payout for a retiring employee next year, and the remainder is due to the projected increase for salaries and benefits. Operating expenditures for fiscal year 21 are decreasing from this year's budget, going from 175,000 to approximately 160,000. The majority of this reduction is due to the replacement of all of the department's personal computers this year, and that's um, a non-recurring item. It happens every three years. A large part of this operating expenditure includes the mediation services and legal services that are needed for housing cases, employment violations, and wage theft. There are also expenses for travel and training, as well as promotional activities and other items that are needed to support the department. There are no significant uh, impact anticipated due to COVID-19, but OHR was recently awarded a $50,000 grant through HUD from the CARES Act funding to be used for fair housing issues related to COVID-19. Paul can speak more about this grant and the intended use of the funds. And at this time, I'll hand it back to him and let him answer. We can both answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Lori. Yeah, we're, we're proud to have been uh, the recipient of that 50,000 grant from HUD. Um, it will allow us, the proposal that we had pitched to our colleagues at the federal level was to conduct a nationwide seminar relating to the fair housing issues of COVID or pandemic. And um, we partnered with the International Association of Official Human Rights Agencies, which is basically an amalgamation of state and local civil rights agencies such as ours across the United States uh, to put this webinar on. We're going to have it no later than August of 21st of, of this year. But the real impact that we anticipate from this is helping our colleagues handle the challenges of conducting mediations and investigations remotely. As you can imagine, um, a lot of our work centers upon making assessments of credibility when you get into issues of he said, she said, or this did occur, it did not occur. 
and credibility determinations, being able to constructively have a dialogue towards a conciliated or mediated agreement is more challenging in a remote environment. And so we plan on having experts from our field and in the industry to talk about that, as well as some of the racial and other uh, protected characteristic impacts of COVID-19 as it relates to fair housing. And uh, we're, we're really pleased to be able to have this partnership with IORA and to have it recognized by HUD and having them grant us this $50,000. Yes, Commissioner Welch. Thank you, Mr. Ch Madam, Madam Chair. I haven't had enough coffee yet today. I'm sorry. Um, Paul, always good to see you. Thank you for your staff's uh, great work. Um, and it's amazing you've been able to absorb so many new responsibilities and keep your level of staffing. Um, first, can you send us your latest uh, wage theft report to date? Yeah, absolutely. Just, just send it to us. And have we, we made some changes to our ordinance so that we'd have one single ordinance countywide. Have we been able to move on that or has COVID slowed us down? Um, it may have slowed us down, but we've continued the momentum. Just last week, I appeared before the St. Pete City Councils, and I, I'm gonna get the committee that it was before for a initial approval before the first reading, before it goes to council for adoption. We are currently looking at that Fine, hoped for final council action in the city on August 12th. Okay. And at the BTS board, we talked about, and I can't remember the title, but it was an accessibility coordinator uh, countywide. It's not in your budget for, for 21. So is that for the next year? So that is, commissioner is still a conversation that's being held. Uh, the TSC, the technical steering committee actually met earlier today and we discussed that they've made some, they have an agreement to go forward to the BTS board again with this suggested position. Um, really the discussion, why it's not in our budget is in part because the discussion is where does this belong? Will the BTS board adopt the recommendation to have this position. And then of course, discussion at the OMB County administration level and you all for um, allocating the funds to the purpose. The question becomes, are we gonna have it housed here? Are we gonna have it housed in OTI or BTS? Are we gonna even have the position? Um, so that's still a conversation being held wherever we land, our office is gonna do its part to ensure that the county, its appointing authorities, are compliant by way of the ADA and our web access. Okay, I, I just got the feeling that there was support at the BTS meeting that it needed to exist and that that your office was the right place for it. So maybe I just misinterpreted that. Um, but I guess this goes back to BTS now. That's my understanding that you'll be seeing it, as I understand it, in a final suggestion and for final adoption or approval by the board at your August meeting. Okay, which will be still in time, I guess, for our, our budget discussions, but really late in the process. So, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions for Paul? Okay, well, thank you, sir. Thank you. And next, we need to extend our local state of emergency. Again. Yes, Commissioner. And so this would be for June the 12th through the June the 19th. Um, we don't have a meeting scheduled for next week. So this would um, uh, make sure there's no lapse in the emergency order. And I know I, we're all going to miss having a meeting next week a lot. <laughs> well, we've uh, we've uh, tapped out this week. So yeah, we I think I'm zoomed out. <laughs> We appreciate the time, but just for the public, you know, we, um, you know, like I said before, we, the message really needs to be clear. You know, we're under the governor's order now. We're going under the governor's phase two order. We do not have, we're extending the emergency order. Uh, we don't have any local restrictions. We're implementing the governor's order. Um, and I, so, you know, like one of the headlines was that when we eliminated our safer home, that it's like county eliminates that, and, and but they didn't say this. The same things still are in place, 
this has not been solved. Um, we are in this for the long run and we need to remember to be safe. You know, we can go out in the community and you can find places where people believe that there's no longer an issue and they congregate in large crowds. So whether it's a governor's order or not, it increases your risk. And we have active cases that every single day uh, from our testing that it's, you know, whether it's 15, whether it's 20, whether it's 35, like we saw the other day, um, you know, we have, we have a number of new cases each day. When you're out in the community, you put yourself at risk, you put others at risk. We still need to be vigilant. We still need to be safe. Um, but this local order extends our, our ability to, for reimbursement. I can continue to stockpile um, and PPE and other things. Um, and um, so we do recommend that we continue this, but we're gonna work really hard on the messaging um, and to make sure that the public understands that this is, we, we need to be constant, we need to be vigilant, we need to not take our foot off the gas. Um, we need to have a, kind of a new way of thinking and, and operating as we go about our daily lives. Well, I think that's true. And one of the things I think we all <clears throat> got concerned about this morning was to hear Dr. Cho say that the incidence is sort of shifting away from long-term care and into the general population. Obviously, you know, based on what we're doing, we're going to see that, but that's unfortunate that people think it's gone away. It's not. Yeah. And my wife and I went out to dinner last weekend and we sat at a restaurant. I won't say where because I don't want to pick on them, but um, across the street was more of a, it was a restaurant, but it was more of a bar. It had a lot of high tops. And I wouldn't have walked over there because you couldn't walk in between people. It would have been like, you know, <laughs> I mean, it was packed. And, you know, I'm, it, it's outside, so it, it didn't violate the governor's order, but, you know, it, it's not the social distancing and, and it puts everybody at risk. Yeah, and I think it's unfortunate that, like, Barbara said that this has turned into a political issue. It's not, it's a public health issue. And yeah, we need to continue to put our message out there. And I see Dr. Cho and Dr. Jamison are on the line. Hi guys. <laughs> uh, yes, Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Madam Chair. The hardest part is there's so much information out there as far as the testing and the cases and to put it in perspective, you know, we're seeing a, a slight uptick in the percentage of positives, but how meaningful is that without knowing the number of tests and when the tests were taken? And, and, and that's the hardest part to wrap around uh, for those of us that are following, let alone if you're just reading the headlines on, online or those. So how does our work group um, going to help us try and wrap those numbers around to where we know all right, we had a slight uptick, but we also had a big dump of test results. So where, where are those percentages and, and where's the alarm bell? And those are the kind of the, the really the toughest parts. Well, I can answer it from my perspective, but we have two experts on the line and Dr. Cho and, and, and Dr. Jamison. Um, but, you know, we look at the percent positives. Um, so as we, as we increase the testing, what percentage of those tests are coming back as positive? We've seen that track below, um, you know, two percent for a while. Now we, as you heard this morning, we had an uptick in that, but it's still below five percent. Um, if you're at back when we were when we began this, um, five percent was what we were drawing in early March. Um, but if you look at what other states were drawing, they were drawing 20, 25 percent. So, so they had a significant more um, exposure out in the population. Um, I don't know what the right answer is. You know, that's I, I, I posed that this morning. Is it you know when when do we sound the alarm bells? And I think we have to think about that because you know we could you know so right now we kind of know the summer months and people are getting out, but what happens in November, you know, or December, and we see an uptick? What is what is that number to where we have to come together as policy group and make some decisions, um, and then apply that with what the public's willing to you know, accept and, and that we can actually enforce. Um, so I, that, those are all great questions that, that, you know, I think we're not alone in trying to struggle with what the right answer is. But I, I, I would defer to Dr. Chong, Dr. Jamison to respond. I'll, I'll chime in here, Barry. Um, so uh, some of the metrics, and I think we've touched on uh, the, some of the ones that we're following, including the case count, 
including the percent positivity to sort of even out the uh, commissioner uh, the variability on the day-to-day -day testing we do start also look at like a rolling seven to 14 day averages and so we can sort of even that out and sort of um, negate some of that variability in, the, in, in those testing numbers so even in the more average with the rolling we are seeing uh, slight increases uh, for both the case count and the percent positivity over the last seven days. Um, I think it's also important to monitor other metrics. Uh, the syndromic surveillance, these are uh, systems within the emergency room, seeing what kind of volume uh, we're seeing. Um, fortunately, those numbers have either plateaued or <coughs> flatlined or have uh, declined. So that is also an earlier indicator. And I, I think one of the more important indication, uh, indicators that we also monitor is the hospital capabilities, uh, uh, ICU bed and ventilator. Um, that's the, the sole reason we did some of the stuff with say at home, the, the flattening the curve. So um, I, I think that is gonna be one of the, the biggest indicators we need to continue to monitor. Dr. Jameson, you have anything you'd like to add? Yeah. Thanks. Uh, I would agree with Dr. Cho. I think we are seeing some indicators that, that we're seeing a bit of an increase here, uh, both in, in absolute case numbers and percent positivity, um, perhaps not unexpectedly um, at this point uh, in the, the curve of this epidemic. Um, and so whatever we can do as a community to keep ourselves safe uh, as we learn to go forward with this uh, would be to our benefit. Um, you know, there's some studies out there that show if if 80% uh, of the community wore a mask uh, all the time, went out of went out of their house, uh, we could have significant uh, shortening of the pandemic. Um, but again, it's just um, people need to remember that these things are additive: washing your hands, social distancing, wearing a mask. Um, it's sort of like a seatbelt in an airbag. Each one gives you a little bit more protection and each one does a little bit more in terms of reducing the harm. Uh, so we just need to continue messaging to folks and making sure that, that we know that this is the long haul. This is not going to be over anytime soon. And we need to be smart about how we go forward to keep everybody safe. All right, thank you. Commissioner Welch. Yeah, I just would also like to just weigh in that uh, in agreement that the messaging is crucial. And as Commissioner Justice says, you know, we get the questions from the community and it's tough for us to even say that A caused B because of some of the delay in testing and then the long-term care facility lag and some of those other things. But folks are going to see, as you mentioned now, I just pulled up the website, you know, the 59 from yesterday. And so we need to make sure we message that, yes, we were expecting an increase as we kind of loosen the restrictions. Yes, we do have ICU capacity and hospital capacity that we're monitoring, but folks can also impact that curve from here on out and they need to continue to social distance. I think part of that problem will be eliminated with the kind of politicization of this when folks see what's actually happening that no, it's not just politics, the um, rate is actually increasing. And then folks will kind of be driven back to, okay, we need to kind of make sure we behave in accordance with what's been recommended. So just, I, I couldn't concur more that the messaging, we just, just have to stay on top of that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Long. Yes, um, I am also concerned about the folks that are continuing to be in the streets and protesting and gathering in very large groups I mean, not just here, but all over the country. And I, I can't help but think that that is just not gonna be good for this issue in the long term. I mean, you know, I mean, hardly any of those people are wearing masks. So I don't know. I mean, I think we have a lot of things that we have to think about and talk about and move quickly on as we go forward. I did have one other question, Madam Chair, before we go. go ahead. I'm sorry. That's all right. Go ahead. Dr. Chill and Jameson or Barry, any word on schools, um, K through 12 in Pinellas? What are their plans on resuming or do we, do we not have definitive info at this point? Dr. Chill, I know you've been working yeah. with uh, Dr. Greco. 
So um, what uh, Dr. Grego has done is uh, assembled a, a team of uh, medical professionals um, and uh, other uh, staff folks to sort of look at some of the protocols as it pertains to reopening. And it's going to be in, in concordance with the CDC guidance and, and any directions probably from the state as well. So we're in the process of looking at those protocols. Do you think it'll be August or you just don't know yet? Uh, I, I can't probably speak to that yet. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Eggers. Commissioner Eggers. You're on mute, Dave. Yeah, sorry. Again, again, <laughs> uh, like I said, I'll, I'll work on that. Sorry, guys. Um, yeah, one of my questions was the schools. Uh, that, so thank you for asking that, um, Commissioner Welch. Um, and I, you know, it's interesting that we, we, we've made this decision kind of to open up, uh, the, the state made their decision and we've, we've kind of moved forward with it. Um, I think this being safer at home and, and being safer while you're out is, is the right message. And we need to keep saying that, you know, try not to take, we still, you know, we still, regardless of how you feel about this thing, we still don't have any, you know, cures for this. And so, um, again, if you're not necessarily worried about yourself, worry about, you know, your parent or your grandparent or, or somebody else and try to be as safe as you can. It, you know, the whole idea of requiring masks and or not requiring masks is still an option and, and certainly don't want to have to go there. The other thing that would be interesting to know, and I do, you know, we, we've heard about, you know, the financial trade off of people getting back to work and getting the economy going for sure. But I also know that we, we were concerned about the elective surgeries that were put on hold um, and, and, and all of those other health issues, whether they're mental health, whether they're elective surgeries or whatever, um, that are now starting to get addressed. Um, so as we look forward and we, you know, cause we all, this all weighs on all of our minds and uh, you know, did we do the right thing? How did we do it? Do we, should we do more? Should we do less that, you know, you, we continue to second guess ourselves. There's that continued trade off on the health side of, 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 of freeing the hospitals up to do what they normally do because people have had some serious surgeries that are considered elective that have been put on hold. So um, I, I don't know how we, how we measure that opportunity that we're addressing now versus some of the other concerns that we have, but all of that has to be taken into account. Um, I think the sheriff asked a pointed question today, you know, about, you know, I'm not sure what the, you know, what our comfort level, you know, starts to break down on things. And, you know, we need to continue asking those questions of ourselves, but also when we get together. Um, but uh, again, please folks, just still be careful. Stay at home if you can, if you get out, be safe, um, you know, get our economy going for sure. But, you know, I think we can be smarter than we have been the last couple, three weeks. And I know some of that's because, well, we've been cooped up for so long. Um, so anyway, um, thank you for at least allowing us to talk a little bit about this concern. Okay. Anybody else? If not, I will entertain a motion to extend yeah. approval. <clears throat> okay, we have a motion. I, from... I, I could, we do need to allow for public comment on this. Oh, item. sorry, I forgot about that. How can I get? <laughs> Do we okay. have anybody would like to comment on this? Yes. Yeah, so at this time, any members of the public who would like to comment on this agenda item should virtually raise their hand by pressing star nine on their phone or by pressing the raise hand button on the Zoom, in the Zoom application. Let's give them a few seconds here. Okay, Madam Chair, at this time, we do not have anybody who would like to comment. Thank you. Okay. Well, we have a motion from Commissioner Seal, second from Commissioner Welch. All in favor of extending our local state of emergency to a week from Friday? Is that, yeah, is that the, what we're doing? The 12th through the 19th. 12th through the 19th. Okay. All right. Raise your hand, please. Say aye. 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 Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. And I believe that's all we have today. 
Well, we have commissioners. We'll have um, another round of uh, budget uh, meetings with departments um, uh, two weeks from now. And uh, again, we'll continue to refine our process and uh, move forward. All right. Well, you all have a nice week and a nice, uh, nice weekend.